Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today's guests are leading psychologist Dr. Doug Brackman and his co-host on the I Am Driven podcast, Meg Terwilliger. With two PhDs in psychology, Dr. Doug has spent his entire career working with top performers to help them overcome their limiting beliefs, stop their cycle of shame, and achieve the ultimate personal and professional success. He has created the Drive Tribe to provide a community to support the driven. And together with Meg, he hosts the I Am Driven podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review at the top of the show page on Spotify or at the bottom of the show page if you are listening on Apple Podcast. Your opinions matter and your ratings help us to grow and help more people to be healthy and find freedom of body and mind and to live their dreams. And now over to Paul, Doug and Meg as they talk about driven or possessed, the need to succeed. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, we are going to talk about something that's really important to understand, especially if you're driven like I am. Arr. My title for the podcast today is Driven or Possessed? The Need to Succeed with Dr. Doug Brockman and his business partner and driven woman, Megan Terwilliger. Welcome to both of you. Thank you, Paul. This has uh, been top of my mind for the last few weeks since we talked and prepped for this thing. So I am, I'm looking very forward to uh, diving deep. Yeah, good. And welcome, Megan. It's nice to have a woman on board, a driven woman. Thank you. Thank you for having us, for having me. I'm very excited. Represent. <laughs> yeah, great. And uh, Doug, uh, we'll... You're a psychologist. Yeah, so a I, PhD. I, this, I have a dual PhD, believe it or not, that I am um, profoundly insecure, and I thought education might get rid of that insecurity, and it didn't oh. work. But I spent oh. two. Yeah, I spent. <laughs> I did. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I do have the equivalent of two PhDs, one in organizational psychology, the other is in clinical psychology. Well, those are both helpful. And Megan, your background is elite athletics, correct? Uh, yeah, I played volleyball, division one uh, volleyball in college and then professionally overseas for a little bit. Okay, great. Well, you know, I've been working with Gabrielle Reese for a very long time, so I have some insight into your background. Yes. Yes. I'm a big fan of Gabby Reese. And she's driven too. Believe she me. Is. Yes. <laughs> so is Laird. That is so true. Yes. Paul. So all of your, as you have discovered what driven means from our, from three weeks ago to today, it sounds like it's much more personal to you. So I, I'm assuming you dived into my content a little bit. Yeah, I, I did. Uh, I also had a very driven woman who was the Ninja Warrior champion of champions who works for us as a marketing expert handling my social media and the institutes, some of the institute's social media. And she is also the teacher for my children. And her husband is our presently our cook, but he also works to condition the kids and educate them. So we have the two of them and, and they train the kids in parkour and ninja warrior type stuff and trampoline and everything else. And Michael teaches the kids uh, art and auto mechanics. They both do and, and how to take things apart and put them back together. So there, uh, I had uh, Kirsty and Michael both read the book. And Kirsty wrote me a report on the book, and uh, some of the questions that are in there came from Kirsty's report, and she said that it was a very good book. I looked through it, and I can, from talking to you and looking through your chapters, I, I get the picture. And so I, I got good feedback on the book from a highly driven, highly intelligent woman who read every word of it for you. I greatly appreciate that. Yeah, it's, um, we are different. And it sounds like your kids are being raised in a very driven atmosphere where they're uh, able to explore and develop all these 
different atypical ways of being in the world? Yeah, my kids are very fiery. Um, Angie's a very driven woman, and I'm full of fire, and and the kids are just like little nuclear bombs. So we have to keep them very, very busy with activities, or they just start getting rambunctious and tearing things apart and going crazy. So the way we handle them is to give them a lot of variety and a lot of attention and a lot of love and that gets them tired by the end of the day so we can retain some sanity around here. Yeah, they have to be tired by the end of the day. Yeah, and so that that, that actually before we dive into all this, one of the questions my client and friend uh Amy Fournier who's here working with me for she's just finished a week of work with me and she's very successful in many ways. She's got a great podcast called Awakening Aphrodite. She used to own a, a big, big gym in Boston. And one of the questions, because she knew I was about to do this podcast with you, she said, well, I have a question for, for, for both of them. Are driven people born, i.e., is it a genetic thing or are they self-created or created by their environment? So why don't we start with that question? I have a pat answer. If you try to figure out, is it nature versus nurture? The answer yes, that, always, that was exactly part of her question. The answer is yes. Nature versus nurture. That's a it paradox. Is, you cannot, yeah, and epigenetics. And when I first started with the story of Driven, um, I met, you know, I'm 54 years old and I missed the wave of ADD, ADHD. Oh my God, their kids are broken, you know. All of that I missed, and so I had no idea what why I was so different. But in the intervening ninety one is when they when they first targeted the dopamine receptor number two, the DR number two dash A one allele gene, and that was the first genetics that they found. And oh my God, we found it—the alcoholism gene. And blah, 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 blah. Now, what is it? Thirty years later. There's 143 different genetics just associated with our reward system alone. So the more you get into this, the more you have to understand that it's always an interaction between our genetics and the environment. Yes, I think that's really the case always. But I also thought it was a good question because really she was saying, do you come in as a driven soul mm. or oh, are I you? do you acquire this in a given lifetime is the deeper issue she was driving at. And that, that <clears throat> is it your soul that's driven or not? I think our souls, and we can go deep, but I will, <laughs> I will save that answer for later. So we need to set some framework before we go there. But, you know, so basically what it means to be driven, I'll just kind of fill you in. I'm building up the work of a guy named Tom Hartman, who, in 1990, mid nineties, he wrote a book and then followed it up with a much better book called the Edison gene. And he talked about Thomas Edison and about what is this difference that you find in all populations, every single, whether it's bacteria or rabbits or squirrels or human beings, you see the variance towards the end of the bell curve, anticipating rapid change in the environment. And so rapidly changing environments, whether you're a bacteria or a human being, requires something different than somebody who is in a very predictable, safe, stable world. Yes. Well, I personally come from a very unstable environment. <laughs> exactly. And that, that is, if you think about, you know, what Hartman did, and I followed it up with a whole bunch of brain research and functional MRI stuff. If you think about what it takes to live in a trauma-filled world, you are you, you know in a much more difficult world and a harder world to survive. The brain and the and the brain primarily and the reward system both adapt to that environment. And over the last four or five thousand years, the environment around us has changed to the most ridiculously stable world. That we you could ever imagine. Not anymore. Well, it's still the world has never been safer. 
A hundred years ago, there was a billion people on this planet. Now there's almost eight. We figured it out. And, you know, that mere survival mechanism kind of model for human behavior. And what I have found and, you know, followed up in the last couple of years of research, it's real, meaning that people who are driven are different. You put us in a functional MRI, we have different results, meaning that, you know, primarily that the back of our heads light up, meaning that the a occipital lobe has the primary activity when you put somebody who is meeting the criteria for ADD, ADHD. And so we basically have a different brain. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that because in, in Joseph Chilton Pierce's book, The Biology of Transcendence, he shows the pictures of the shapes of babies' heads and talks about brain research and shows that kids that are raised in stressful environments develop the brain of street fighters versus kids that are raised in stable environments where they have a much, lot more frontal cortex activity. Mm -hmm. And so he, I can't remember if he links that specifically with ADHD or ADHD behavior, but really those behaviors are constantly search, scanning the environment for threats. Correct. Because they because they come from that unstable environment, but you know, th this is all interesting. But it brings up a thought on the soul issue. You know, my brother, I have uh, a sister, two a sister, a half sister. My uh, my brother, one year younger than me, committed suicide at thirty four, oh. and then my uh, step brother, who he's my half brother, he's nine years younger than me. We all ate from the same table, lived in the same environment, but I'm the only one that was really, that turned out to be driven. So you see, I bring that up because they've all, you know, th three of them had the same genes as me. Two of them had my mother's genes, but we all lived in the same circumstances, but it produced a very different result in me than it did in them. And that lends itself more to the nature of a soul than it does to genetics and epigenetics. So that you are leading me down a very well thought out path that I've spent the last year or two thinking about. And it, it's very simply this soul question. And you know, we have the way I present it in the book is a very simple model that we have this, you know, thing between our ears, which is our brain. Then you have a recording device down below it, which is our body. But you have this third thing. And is it consciousness? Is it our soul? Is it this? But that is. For me, where I go back to is my second grade, third grade experience. Because I was sitting in class and had the insight, big picture focus around how much this was bullshit. That memorizing multiplication, multiplication tables and memorizing spelling less and memorizing this crap would never help me in the big picture of things. I felt the same way. Exactly the same way. The only classes that I did well, it's funny, I was just having this conversation recently with somebody and I was describing my experience of school. And I said, you know, it's interesting when I think back to my report cards, I always did very well in the classes where the teachers were engaging, engaging, were passionate and talked about how what we were learning would be used in our life. So I could connect, like when I was taking auto mechanics in, in high school, it was obvious to me learning how to fix an engine was helpful because I came from a farm where engines broke all the time and I was into racing motocross and 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 later I got into stock car racing but and my my father was a professional drag racer so engines were kind of in my blood so I could see I remember his name Mr. Farver he was just the wildest coolest teacher I'll never forget, he took a spark plug lead off a V8 engine that was running and held it to his tongue. Oh, God. And his whole body just went into shock, you know, with 50,000 volt blasts. 
and his tongue was dancing like a mad woman. And, uh, you know, it was things like that that engaged me. Biology. I was interested in what was inside of things. Physical fitness. I always got an A. Metalwork. I always got an A. Woodwork. Okay. Got Bs. Didn't find wood as exciting as metal. Social studies bored the shit out of me. English bored the shit out of me. French couldn't stand it. Um, home economics couldn't stand it. You know, so the problem was is that my parents kept getting these bad report cards and giving me loads of shit. But when I would tell them, I can't stand these classes because the teachers are boring and they wouldn't answer any of my questions. So inevitably, I found myself just like dreading school and thinking about I couldn't wait to get home to, you know, jump on my motorcycle, which was my it's, sort of it's, it's, outlet. Every driven person I've worked with, and it's been quite a few over the last 30 years, the one thing that we are craving the most is freedom. Yeah. And it is knowing I couldn't believe the rest of the third grade class could tolerate being trapped in this bullshit. Yeah, neither could I. And so I think, you know, driven and talking about, you know, soul, and I'm hesitant to say it, but I'll say it anyway. I think there's a good chunk of the population that doesn't have very much soul awareness. Oh, that's damn true. That's partly, that's partly what I'm trying to create with all my podcasts and all of my teachings. The entire institute is really ultimately a vehicle to bring you into soul awareness, which you've got to do through people's bodies first, because if you try to do it any other way, it's too ethereal for them. It's like talking about God. All you can do is lean to books until you have your own experiences. So, you know, yeah, you're right. Uh, but there's, there's the other end of the continuum too. People Meaning. that are so hyper aware of their soul. We walk around in a disassociated fugue all the time and kind of walk in on a bliss cloud and you're never attached to reality. Yeah, I call those airheads. Mm -hmm. that, that is, you know, and I meet a lot of driven people that go down the yogi path and, oh my God, they're going to go to an ashram and really go dive deep into this. But they're going in the wrong direction, as you say. I mean, they're, they're trying to escape. They're trying to transcend, so to speak, this mundane experience we're having here. Yeah, I don't think that works. Um, that's like trying to transcend your garden. It'll just be full of weeds and you'll have nothing to eat. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So it, it's having this freedom-loving, acutely aware soul of mine that almost killed me. Yes. Um, I think mine kept me alive. Um, there was always something inside of me that allowed me to face danger and severe threats and not back down, which carried me through my martial arts and boxing career and motocross racing and parachute <laughs> jumping and being a paratrooper in the military. I, I always could look the devil in the eye, so to speak. So I think that's the soul. Um, my brother who killed himself also was ruthless when it comes to facing uh, danger and also was hell bent for freedom with all cost. The difference between him and I is he always spent all his energy trying to figure out how to get out of getting a job done. And I just said, you're wasting time dad's just going to beat the hell out of you. Why don't you just get it done and we can get out of here. And so he was such a rebel that he had to fight to get his way. But you, you know, you long story made short, uh, you know, an, an eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 year old fighting a six foot four, 220, 220 pound ex-professional rodeo rider doesn't go very far. Mm. So my point is there, you see the difference in souls. I was oriented towards what is the path of least resistance to give me the most freedom. And he was more oriented toward the rebellious aspects of fighting like hell because he felt 
he wasn't being treated fairly. And so he would end up spending five hours fighting to get out of a three hour job. Perfect, perfect segue into what I'm working on is, is so the difference in this left prefrontal lobe, when you put somebody normal, and I air quote the shit out of that, into a functional MRI, you see this nice bright ball of energy on their frontal lobe, particularly on the left side, which is the logical, rational, linear way of thinking through this yeah. world. And you think about a farmer, you know, it's it's very simply they follow a structure and a routine, and that leads to safety. And my joke about being unemployable, I truly am unemployable. I mean, I cannot have someone who tells me what to do and to trust them without me thinking about how to do it better. That's exactly, that's me all the way, all my life. Now I've had to work for a lot of people, but I was always looking for ways to improve things and do things better. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't appreciate that, especially in the military. Mm. So, you know, I'm I'm harmonizing with you in the sense that when I got out of the military, my chief objective was to never have to be told what to do by anybody. So I knew I had to create my own path, my own business, my own life, because I found most people just have such poor creative thinking and constructive thinking abilities. I'll give you a perfect example of the kind of stuff that drives me right fucking loopy. Sorry, sorry if you got kids listening. I've gone to coffee shops all over the world trying to get a properly made espresso. And they'll always not pack it right or leave the machine dirty or get the grind wrong. And you'll get what I call cattle pee. And then I'll... St- sit there and say, look, this is how you make an espresso. I've studied it. I have six espresso machines. I know how to do it. I can only drink one a day. I want to, I'm happy to pay you. I'll pay you twice as much if you just do it right. And here's how you do it. And the most common answer I get is I can't do that. I go, why not? You got a machine, you got a grinder. I'll show you how to adjust the grinder and adjust the machine. You'll make the best espresso. You'll sell more and people will be happier. Oh, I can't do that. My, this is what my boss told me I have to do. I said, but your boss's job is to sell espresso and I'm trying to buy it off you. And I want a real one. I don't want some kind of garbage. <laughs> you know, I, you, know you, you cannot get these people to think or to have a spree decor or to want to do something better. They just want to be told what to do, not think, follow routine and be sheep. And that drives me crazy, the result of which I had six espresso machines littered all over the world so I didn't have to go to espresso <laughs> shops. <laughs> and I will say it to you like I've said to every other driven person, it is a farmer's world, my friend. This is not our world. Yeah, you know, to be fair to farmers, though, um, farmers can be very intelligent people. I grew up on Vancouver Island. Yeah, and I, I don't mean it literally. I mean domesticatability is another way to say it. Yeah. Some people are incredibly easily domesticated. Yes. Yeah. Where I I am, as my wife will attest to, I should have been beaten more as a kid. <laughs> I don't think that would have helped. My brother's proof of that. I don't that. think so either. But it, it, it is this, we are different. And that is the yeah. message I really want to get out to the world. and. The biggest part of this left prefrontal thing is our identity. And so as the cultural anthropology wise, you know, as we went from these hunter gatherer groups of 30, 40 people figuring out how to survive and, you know, we danced and had sex all day um, into these giant, massive societies. Yeah. The left prefrontal allowed people, allowed an identity to develop just simply around their career, a butcher, a baker, a candlestick maker. This is what I do. Well, that's, you can see the history of that in people's last names. I mean, the name shoemaker or blacksmith Mm -hmm. or Smith or any men, there's many names that are really the names of what their parents did. 
And that, that simple identity isn't questioned by a massive frontal lobe that is trying to figure everything out. No. They just simply accept it and go along with go along. And it, it is their world. And you know, the, the Navy SEAL saying that there's three kinds of people in this world. There's the most are sheep, but then there's wolves preying on the sheep and also shepherds here to protect the sheep. Yes. Well that's a good way to put it. Hi, everybody. I suspect you know that personal trainers and strength coaches are often underappreciated, particularly by the medical community at large. And yet they are probably the most important group of allied healthcare professionals because they're engaged in their clients' lives far more deeply than most any other healthcare professional. Current statistics show that the average medical doctor only spends six minutes with each patient. Most physical therapists, chiropractors, and osteopaths have adopted the medical model, running what I call revolving door clinics. They often use hot and cold packs, ultrasound, and other palliative care procedures implemented by assistants so that the therapist or doctor can devote less time to each patient, being able to bill insurance companies for an hour of treatment time, but that approach seldom addresses the root cause, thus the revolving door model. Personal trainers work with their clients often on a weekly basis, sometimes as much as three times a week, and they often work with them on diet, stress management, stretching, exercise, and listen to their clients' personal problems. So, they really get to know their clients, and there's a real therapeutic value in that. That means trainers have a huge potential to impact the health and well-being, not only of their clients, but the whole world. But there is one very important thing. The fitness industry has not helped personal trainers optimize their potential to develop their skills to truly master what they do. While personal trainers are now the goaltenders, being some of the only allied healthcare professionals that give their clients attention, they suffer from many challenges, such as a poor understanding of functional anatomy, a serious lack of assessment skills. Remember, if you're not assessing, you are guessing a tendency to use trendy diets or assume that their diet is the right diet for their clients as opposed to understanding and teaching individualized eating. They are also heavily trapped in the idea that supplements will address symptoms or prevent health challenges while not resorting to sound, organic, and biodynamically farmed foods to meet fundamental nutritional needs for the long run. Additionally, most of the supplements personal trainers use and sell are notoriously poor quality. There is a lack of training in behavioral modification, a poor understanding of how to use corrective exercise, skilled movement assessments, and effectively select exercises. Most personal trainers have poor program design skills, regardless of who they are training or what age category they are in, or even what sport their clients participate in. Almost all their programs look the same, just like their own. Most personal trainers and strength coaches have a dangerous tendency to use functional exercises that are far too advanced for their clients, but may be trendy, which sadly results in a lot of unnecessary injury. Personal trainers should be taught to thoroughly assess their clients, to design holistic programs that account for their clients' specific needs, goals, and abilities. They should also inspire their clients to continue even when the world is in chaos. That's intelligent training, which empowers each and every client to achieve their health goals. If you're a personal trainer or a strength coach, or you want to be a personal trainer, I've created the online training program to help you maximize your potential and impact on the world. It's called Integrated Movement Science Level 1 Online. This course will teach you many things, including the essential four doctor principles I've developed. You'll learn how to see through the eyes of Dr. Happiness, Dr. Diet, Dr. Movement, and Dr. Quiet for a truly holistic program design approach. You'll learn how the gut and brain interact with each other, how to perform comprehensive flexibility tests, core function tests, and know what joint mobilization stretches and exercise will balance each client's body scientifically, how to assess posture, joint stability, and how to isolate dysfunctional muscles and then integrate them into functional movements, how to assess movement, select exercises, and design exercise programs scientifically, how to progress client programs safely and effectively for optimal short 
and long-term results and much more. And now you can do this training from anywhere in the world as long as you have an internet connection. If you really want to tap into your full potential as a personal trainer, strength coach, and build a rewarding career doing it, this is the course for you. If you are a massage therapist, acupuncturist, physical therapist, or doctor, Integrated Movement Science 1 online will expand your assessment skills and exercise prescription abilities, helping your patients regain real health, freedom, and fitness for the long run. Go to the check shop. That's the c h e k shop.com forward slash i m s one online and get started now. The check shop.com forward slash i m s one online and get started now. I think you'll be amazed at how much more you will understand and how much more abilities and skills you will have to offer all your clients. I want to just show your book here. It's the book title is Driven, Understanding and Harnessing the Genetic Gifts Shared by Entrepreneurs, Navy SEALs, Pro Athletes, and maybe you. Maybe. <laughs> and so for, for those of you that are listening, and a lot of the people that follow my podcast would definitely be in the driven category. I can tell you that for sure. What gets people in my office is the lack of our identity. And one of the most consistent things driven people feel is impending doom. And that sense of impending doom, this this feeling that there's everything could be better, this isn't all that great, this, this you know comes in two varieties around dopamine, boredom is a simple one, but the more interesting one, which you fall into that category, is the dopamine receptor number four. And it's the FOMO gene. It's the feeling that the grass is greener over the next hill. There's more woolly mammoths over there. What's FOMO again? I forgot. Fear, Fear missing of missing out. out. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. You know, I've never really been an impending doom guy. I've always been. No, a- but you, you turn this into the perfect cup of espresso. <laughs> right. So you see, I'm I'm an impending possibility guy. I'm like always, there's always a way out, but you, you're not going to find it watching fucking television and staring at your phone you got to do something about it and uh you know i think that's what brought me into being an elite soldier is you know problem solving and you know i was always the pathfinder or, or you know so the guy that they put out front so that i was the one the first to encounter enemies and report back that we have trouble on the way so uh, i didn't do well in the pack but they quickly learned that i'm best on my own and that's where they put me um, but I was always a man looking for possibilities and I still am to this very day. I, I always think there's possibilities. And that, that is a big difference between you and your brother. Yeah, I guess so. You know, Doug and Megan, I've studied approximately 150 biographies of the world's greatest thinkers, inventors, scientists, mystics, business moguls, politicians, philosophers, saints, musicians, singers, movie stars, savants, and athletes. And, you know, the reason I did that is because as a young person, I kept getting told by teachers, you're never going to amount to anything. And I was always in trouble. And, you know, I didn't like that they told me that I wasn't going to amount to anything because usually they were mad at me because they couldn't answer my questions, which just pissed me off. So what I figured out as a young person, person is that if I wanted to be successful, I had to figure out how successful people did it. So for a lot of my career, I've spent studying biographies of the world's greatest achievers and thinkers. And probably the most common denominator among them is some kind of a deep wounding early in their life, often repeated throughout their careers. So like take Tina Turner, or Michael Jackson's family. Um, Mike Tyson, and the list is long. And from my studies of such people and working with many of them and being a driven person myself, I find that the wounding is often a double-edged sword because it's integral to what strengthens and inspires them often to help others while at the same time being what leads them to addictions, illnesses, relationship challenges, and frequently an early death. If you study a lot of these biographies, it's just shocking how many of them didn't live that long. So could you please share your thoughts in regard to this wounding and the double-edged sword and how it relates to driven people? And it builds 
right off of what I was just saying about our identities as driven people. And I, I could have called the book The Shame-Based Personality Type. Yeah, you know, I, I, I'll let you share what you want to share, but I have some thoughts on shame. That's a Christian concept. I think it's it's got a lot of um, this, this pathology this, wrapped around it. I agree. It. And I, as a licensed psychologist, I know all the bullshit associated with labels. But it, it is very simply the most consistent thing in my world, and I'll speak from personal experience, is this feeling that I can do better. And when someone looks at me and says, I don't think you can do that, there's an internal fuck you. Oh, yes, yes. I've lived that my whole life. And that that internal is, is and what got me off of cocaine, believe me, I almost died from my addictions myself, is this insight that I know I'm fucked up, but I'm not nearly as fucked up as you all think I am. <laughs> that's that's a good self-esteem booster right there. And it, it, it is, it, but it provides this possibility insight thing about, you know, and it's you want to send a driven person to hell, try to have them figure out who they are. Am I my behaviors? Am I my feelings? Am I my thoughts? Am I just an animal? Am I my soul? Am I my... because of the way our brain works, it's limitless possibilities. Well, yes, and that and that turns out to be the chief question I spent a lot of my life exploring. Fortunately, I found the answer, which often people don't. But uh Anyhow, continue. Yeah, and, and that deep wounding shame, you know, I'm, I sent me into Carl Jung and how I wound up as a psychologist was uh, figuring out pretty clearly at 18 that living in a car really sucks. <laughs> it, <laughs> That'll do it, yeah. Living in a car with no money and couch surfing your buddies, you know, until they get sick of you, um, forced me into insight about, you know, as you experience, you know, what the hell am I doing? Yeah. And that is a soul searching question. Yeah. I think awareness plays a big, big role in the turning point from what that, that fear based drive gets you somewhere until it kills you. Like, and, and if you can develop some awareness around that deep wounding and how it's been driving you and change that fuel, then you can avoid a lot of the you know, demise and results that we've seen from like Tina Turner and some of the most famous driven people we know. Yeah, I, I, I do agree with that. I, you know, I had an experience when I was 24. Um, I won't go through a long explanation of it because I have talked about it on podcasts before, but basically I was in a tournament, boxing tournament, and I fought probably the toughest guy I'd ever fought and he knocked me down and, and hurt me really bad twice. And I'm like, holy shit. I had a state of primal fear come over me. I'm in front of 5,000 people fighting for the championship of the 82nd airborne division. And people are, I had generals and all sorts of people betting money on me, but I, I just had this flip switch flip in me where I just realized I had to take this guy out no matter what. And I hit him so hard, he literally was out cold and convulsing and just coming right off the canvas in, in, in convulsions. And I detached his retina. Uh, and it, it caused a, a, a very deep crisis to occur in me. And I literally sat in the changing room after the match, even though I won and all the fighters on my team were celebrating and happy. And Paul, you did it. You did it. and what's wrong with you? Why are you crying? And they couldn't understand it. And I, I realized at that moment, I had to stop using my energy to hurt people mm -hmm. because I also realized I was really taking all the pain of my father, my stepfather, and using it as a vehicle through combative sports to try to purge it out of me. But I realized that, you know, I, I, as even though I did it legally and in boxing and kickboxing, I, I hurt a lot of people quite badly. And so at that moment, my heart just broke. And I realized if I don't use this life force energy in me to help people, I'm going to kill somebody. 
all because I'm pissed off at my dad for being such an asshole. And so that was the day that my life changed. And I really changed my devotion from really from combat to helping people heal and, and, and find a path to express what was in them in ways that were ultimately fulfilling instead of um, painful. And, and after that experience, I became the trainer of the Army boxing team. And I said to all 30 fighters on the team, how many of you are really pissed off at your father and got into boxing or martial arts because you felt you had to defend yourself? Out of the 30 fighters, 28 of them raised their hands. Mm -hmm. So I, I, and I've looked into this with elite fighters because I've worked with them for my whole career. And it's a very common theme with rare exceptions that most people that are at high level competition of martial arts begin because of an internal core threat in the family. I, and if it's not in their last generation, I promise you it's in the generation before or before that. Yeah. And that's what I'm finding is that, you know, another title for my book is, you know, how the human brain and reward system adapt to transgenerational trauma. Right. So when, when we're talking about the wounding, you know, it, it, it is a double edged sword because I don't think if I had the wounds that I did and the psychological stress from being told I'd never amount to anything, because all it did is piss me off and make me try harder. I don't think I would have had the, the deep drive to prove myself and to reach the point where I acknowledge myself as a valuable human being. But I also know that in the process, I, I, I had a lot of stressful relationships and there was many times in my life where I was right on the edge of doing something like, you know, I've had situations where people were getting up in my face about things because they didn't agree with me. And I took everything I had not to just choke them out. So, uh, <laughs> you are truly. My point, though, that I want to finish is what drives us can make us successful, can make us famous, but it can also get us put in jail, drug addicted. And you can find jails full of guys like me and you that just didn't get to cross the path. You know, chances are good if I turn pro in boxing, I would have been brain dead by the time I was 30, you know, and, and I, I know guys that were brain dead at 22 years old from boxing and kickboxing. So I, I guess what I'd love to hear from either or both of you is what inspiration can we give these driven people with these challenging backgrounds so that the very thing that can drive them to success and may already have doesn't terminate them or ruin their relationships or put them in a situation where they've got to use drugs to navigate life to the point that they just become dysfunctional human beings with a lot of responsibility. Yep. And it, it, it's, I'll take the first stab at it, but I'm dying to hear Megan. <laughs> um, when our deep shame gets triggered, that deep shame meaning that this deep, achy, hurt feeling inside, when you punch that guy in the face and realize how much pain you can inflict on another human being, yeah. if you identify with that monster that lives inside of us, yes, that's shame. If you don't acknowledge that monster that lives inside of you, like you say, we're all Hitler. Deep, deep down inside, I have that same genetic wiring that I can be a wolf. Yeah. I can, I can. But I'm also a shepherd. Yes. I didn't associate that with shame in myself, just for your own awareness. For me, it was fear of the dragon that if unleashed, I didn't know if I could stop it. And, and I... I, my brother and I used to fight like hell and he was a dangerous, dangerous human being. I have 
holes in my head and wounds in my body to this very day. And so I felt that primordial fear rise up where I had to incapacitate him for my own survival. And so when I was in that experience in the boxing ring, it wasn't shame. It was fear that if that happened again outside of a sanctioned boxing match, as a guy who spent half his life training to fight and was good at it, I may really hurt somebody and, or even kill them. And that could just destroy my life and that person's life and everybody connected to them. So for me, it was just, I have to take this dragon and put it to work doing something useful in the world before it becomes a force of destruction. And I'll be damn honest with you, with what's going on in the world right now and knowing enough about who's behind it, I feel that same primordial urge to, you know, the soldier in me wants to, wants to go out and, and clean up the mess and round up a few of the other ones just like me. But it forces me to really walk the tightrope of spirituality. I have to decide because I don't want to become the very evil that I'm, I'm so violently opposed to. You know, it's, 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 I find myself being strung from both ends. One end says protect the people of the world. And the other end says, you're probably just going to get yourself killed, leave your family without a father to protect them. And you're just going to be one of many that are going to try that path. So I think when we're in an environment like we're in with all the bullshit going on in the world, driven people are the ones that are the first ones to really want to do something about it. But there's where you got to be really careful about how you manage that inner drive because you can find yourself lowering to the level of the enemy and becoming a mere image of them, but calling it good. Mm -hmm. uh, Doug talks in his in the book about um, an ego tunnel, and for for me personally, that was a big turning point of um, reality checking my fear. And I think probably for a lot of driven women specifically who have, you know, run on their drive and run on their fear um, because of that deep wounding for little girls, it's no one's going to take care of me. I have to take care of myself. You know, innocence, if you think of innocence as a flower in a stampede, that flower's fucked. Like little girls become these rocks. Um, and then it's that, that wake up point in realization that, these men in the world aren't attacking me. I don't have to be a rock anymore. I can be grateful for what I've experienced that, that got me out of that situation into where I am now, but it's the recognition that you have to transform again. Yes. I think, I think we should all remember that we are in a perpetual state of metamorphosis, mm -hmm. you know, that we don't have to stay wounded. We don't have to, we can change our perception. We can, you know, for me, when I realized that my father was really doing the best he could with the mindset that he had and the parenting that he had, you know, I, I try to remind people everyone's loving the, the best they can. And it's hard to realize that when people hurt you. But it was, for me, it was the biggest turning point in my life to just say, okay, he made me tough. He gave me a lot of skills. I have to use what he gave me and not focus on the pain that he gave me, or I'll always be reacting to the pain, which means you're always looking to medicate yourself in some way. And for me, combat sports was my medication for my brother. It was drugs. He was a drug addict by the time he was in the seventh grade. Yeah. So I think for any of you listening that can resonate with what we're talking about, I think if you can find a way to forgive the people that hurt you, it, it, it doesn't mean you have to like them. It's just important to love them by realizing that they too are broken people. I, I always say broken parents break their children. Yeah. Hurt people hurt people. Yeah. Yep. And that, that, discernment between what I do with all of my shame-based people or this, this, where you create an identity out of that awful feeling of hurt. Yes. 
and that you know I'll call that shame for lack of a better and despite all the negative connotations to it but it, it's <clears throat> as driven people we by nature and by the way our brain works um and our vagal nerve we we tend to be very empathetic meaning that we can read the room really oh yes well. absolutely like incredibly well and it's somewhere between our eyesight being acute we see all the little tiny subtle cues body language whatever or you know the vagal nerve there's some evidence now that you actually are sensing energy believe it or not oh i'm i'm hip oh yeah and it, it is this discernment between pain and fear. Pain is the opposite and intimately connected with joy. Yeah, the root word of bliss is actually, Joseph Campbell describes how if you study the etymology of the word bliss, it comes from the origin of the word pain. Mm. Yeah. And it is, it is this understanding that they're intimately connected. And feelings of pain mean separation. And every cell in my body wants to be connected to the next cell. And if they're separated, I feel physical pain. Yes. Emotional pain is the separation of that, you know, your herd, your wolf pack. Mm -hmm. And that, but fear is different than that. And, you know, I always give the example that, you know, if I pull in my driveway and my wife and kids are dead, I'm sorry, Doug, house is on fire, policeman holding me back, let him burn. I literally, I would go into a full collapse of pain, probably throwing up in my driveway. It would hurt so bad. Yes. That is because I love them. Yes. Pain is love. From that perspective, yes. From if I'm scared of that pain. I can go to the extreme, and that's my joke, is I always, you know, I'll dig a hole in the backyard, put a school bus in it, hide my wife and kids in there, and never let anything happen to them. Mm -hmm. That's over-loving. Oh, it's fear. Yeah. You know, and, and perfect love does cast out all fear, but perfect love, the only thing that's in the present moment is love. And it's both in the sense of Two, meaning that we are completely separate from everything else, which is hell. <laughs> yeah. And also one, which means that we're also all intimately connected as one big thing. We're all stardust and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Fear is only present when you're not present. Mm -hmm. And I teach that to my Navy SEALs. And it's it's literally when you're, as you can attest, I don't know, have you ever been shot at? If you get shot at, it's an exhilarating, blissful experience. I mean, it is a profound experience while it's happening. Yeah, I, I've been shot at so close that the sound of the bullet hurt my ears. And um, you don't I'll feel the you. fear until you're safe enough to feel it. Well, what it did to me is make me angry. Um, the the first thing I did was tell my father, but the guy shot several rounds at me and our house. And, and when he bounced a bullet off our 600 gallon fuel tank, my father went over and had a one time conversation with his father. <laughs> God, how old were you? Uh, probably about 14. Yeah. I was out in the field working and this guy that lived across the street, crazy crazy broken child uh thought he would be his normal idiot self and shot around right past my head and a couple more rounds right next to me and then bounced one off our fuel tank and uh you know that but my only point in sharing the story is is that uh it just made me angry because I'm like this guy is an idiot and you know i i can't stop him from doing this so you know before i could even get to my father to tell him what had just happened he heard the bullet hit the fuel tank and he could hear the sound of the gun going off cuz this guy was across the field probably about 20 acres of field and then an island highway and he lived across the island highway so probably about 700 meters away <laughs> and and you know but uh 
my only point in bringing that up is I know exactly what it's like to plus I was a soldier. So I was in tons of live fire drills. And it, it's exhilarating until you actually realize or have the big picture about how scary it actually is. Well, you know, death is very close by when a bullet's going near you. <laughs> you. You get a real sense of, you know, Carl Jung says no man is fully alive until he has the power to destroy himself. And so mm. uh, it, it, you're also fully alive when you realize someone has the power to destroy you. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Sometimes I'm in a hurry and in a hurry between engagements, lunch or dinner. And dinner won't be ready for a while, so I just want to eat something delicious that's quick and easy. And that is when I say, thank God for Paleo Valley. Paleo Valley has extremely high standards and only uses the highest quality, cleanest sources for their animal and plant food products. And they have excellent jerky meats neatly packaged so you can take them anywhere and never be stuck without something great to feed your beautiful body and stabilize your mind. I love their pasture-raised turkey sticks in the original and cranberry orange flavor. Angie Penny and the kids absolutely love their grass-fed beef sticks, which come in jalapeno summer sausage, garlic summer sausage, teriyaki, and original flavors. I can assure you Paleo Valley's meat sticks are so good you could literally make a meal of them or have them as snacks and you'd feel satisfied and satiated and know you've fed your body top-quality nutrition that will make your cells dance for joy. Yoo-hoo! Paleo Valley has lots of other great additions to meet your food and nutrition needs, and their website is loaded with great articles, podcasts, recipes, and more. Go to www.paleovalley.com. To get your 15% Living 4D discount, use the code CHECK15, all small case, C-H-E-K-15 on checkout. The whole family will be satiated, nourished, and glad you did. You know, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, and I've got a lot of experience with this because I've worked with many people that have this, Jung speaks of archetypal possession, uh, a state in one of one that is fused into an archa- dra- archetypal drama and so deeply in pursuit of the goal they're trying to achieve that they lose sight of everything else and it often leads to... Um, living like somebody's possessed. I've worked with many elite triathletes, biathletes, ex-gamers, and I, I have to go through this kind of thing with them all the time. So I'd like to hear what your thoughts are on the difference between driven and being possessed from the Jungian perspective. They often go hand in hand until they meet people like us. So it's, um, and I give a koan in my book, that I worked on for two years before I actually came up with a sufficient answer. But it, 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 when a driven is no longer identifying with their emotion, their shadow, their, their hurt feelings, and they're trying to identify with this basic narcissism, they're trying to identify with the results they've achieved. Going to you know my opening comment about the dual PhD, I was hoping it would get rid of this hurt and this pain of feeling like a fucking moron. Uh huh. Didn't work. Meaning that even after the PhD is after my name, this inner experience I'm having didn't go away. And it's the two seconds after crossing the and I've done Ironmans. It's two seconds after crossing the finish line of an Ironman. It feels amazing for two seconds. If that, until your head turns around and you look at the time, the moment you have a result that you can identify with, you're at risk of possession. And, you know, the second commandment is, is have no idol before me. It's where you're idolizing a result and you believe that's going to change you as a fundamental person. I have been possessed and I <laughs> frequently have moments of possession where the results are so unbelievably important for me i'm willing to do anything for them yeah it's a it's a it's a challenging situation and it leads to a lot of problems i've seen a lot of divorces come from it and um you know the way i handle that is i sit down with people and i ask them 
what is it that you need to survive and remain whole enough as a person to live your life fully? And almost always, some of the first things that are said is, well, my wife or my wife and kids or my family or, um, you know, they, 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 they often don't even realize what they're saying. And I say, okay, now I want you to look at what you just said and I want you to write it down. And then I want you to look at what's happening in your life and why you're having challenges with your wife, why you're often upset at yourself because you're not spending time with your kids or why you're having challenges in relationships. And almost always they realize it's because they're avoiding the very thing that they know at a deeper level that they need the most to be a whole person. And oftentimes they don't realize that they couldn't be the person they are without the support of the people that they're avoiding. So then I use my four doctor model and say, okay, what is happy making for you? Usually it's whatever they're possessed by. And then I say, okay, now we have to have values in order to keep you from being possessed because when you possess, it means you're losing yourself. It means that you're not really there. Something else is, is there. And if you don't know what that something else is, you never know who you are. Therefore, you never know who's accomplishing or not accomplishing anything. And that's an endless trap. It leads to burnout. And if, as an athlete or anybody, if you lose your path or your career because you destroyed yourself, then you actually are in this very dangerous place of having disabled yourself and never knowing who you are. And now you are stuck as a broken person who can't have the freedom that they were ultimately trying to create in the first place. So it's kind of like a Mexican finger trap. The harder you pull, the harder it binds. Yeah, that's a great description of a con. It is, it is that bind that calls forth the derivens to really ask that important question that you've been trying to answer. You know, who am I? And because I sure it can't be my feelings. I can't be the results of all my hard work. I can't be, you know, so we wind up esoterically, you know, with this big question mark. What I do in my book is answer it very simply. Is, is rather than who, it's a what. Mm -hmm. What am I? What I am is an animal. Can't deny that. No matter what you do, we can all agree that human beings are animals. And then on top of that, I am not my feelings. I am not my thoughts. I'm not the sensations of my body. I'm not just all of those other things. What am I? And your work, you know, where you're calling forth people's soul identity. Who you really are is the one who wants the freedom. Who you really are is the one who wants this sense of righteousness. Who you really are is the one who wants this sense of balance and purpose. None yeah. of those things will come from behaviors or chasing that as an outcome. Because what you're going for is a state of being, not a thing you're doing. I think part of the problem is an identity crisis because most of the things that we do as driven people until we have a spiritual awakening is something to acknowledge that we are useful, capable, powerful. Um, that we can be successful, that we can be loved by other people, wanted by others, needed by others, needed on a team, needed um, because you make money for doing what you're doing, needed because you're supporting other people through your your <laughs> drivenness. Um, so the, the 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 thing that I've found is that whenever there's an identity crisis then the driven behavior continues until the identity crisis has healed itself. And when you realize that you're, the things that you do are an expression of, like art is an expression of an artist or music is an expression of, of a musician, but who you really are inside yourself is something much greater than any of those temporary tasks or accomplishments. And and that 
that really requires somebody that has the skill from having lived that path to guide somebody into it, or it just becomes a bunch of philosophical, academic um, gobbledygook. Could not agree more, Meg. <laughs> Megan, tell us your path from two years ago to today, how your identity has shifted. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that, like Doug was saying, identity is a huge component for driven women. A lot of the women that we work with are moms. And there's a big uh, conflict in identity for driven women who are mothers and being, you know, feeling guilty while they're at work, that they're not with their kids, and then feeling guilty while they're at home, that they're not advancing. Um, so my identity was very similar in that uh, I was striving for results to prove that I'm good enough to prove that women in general are just as strong as men um, and not appreciating or valuing this entire landscape of femininity. And it all goes back to that wounding and feeling like you need to protect yourself and you overdevelop a lot of these masculine traits and you undervalue just like society currently um, undervalues a lot of feminine um, approach to things and, and feminine power. So my experience the last two years in working with Doug and training under Doug is really around understanding what's that innate part of me that's, that's driven, you know, that, um, is looking over the horizon or as a creative thinker or, um, a risk taker. And what part of me is that, social scripted, um, you know, striving to prove myself, um, and kind of trying to, to separate those two. Well, what ultimately did it then? Lots of crying on my yoga mat. I, that's, that's my running joke with women is I had to first understand that my view of the world is bias and, um, Femininity is strong. There are good men, lots of them. Uh, and I had to understand that my experience with the world is not the world. It's not the reality. It's It was my reality up until that point. And becoming more open to that and understanding and just studying the shit out of um, masculine and feminine dynamics. Uh, and because you look for confirmation bias, you look for all the reasons that that uh, men are oppressing women and you, you can find them if you're looking for them. Um, yes. So I had to go look for the things and I've, I've read, um, you know, I have a pretty big bias against Christianity. So I've spent a lot of time in the last six months reading Christian texts and trying to say, if I'm not right, and if there is value in this, if there are nuggets from God in this, how can I understand it differently so that I embody it so that I believe it so that I can see the good they are trying to do here. Well, yeah, it's hard to do reading Christian texts. You need to read a book like The Third Jesus by Deepak Chopra or study <laughs> Father Thomas Keating or uh, Matthew, Meister, Fox. <laughs> or Matthew Fox is a very good place to go for, for that. But yeah, I can but notice in my body how even the language used triggers me. Oh, yes. So it's, it's, it's completely an exercise in understanding my unconscious bias. Yeah. If you listen to my four podcasts with Anna Retort, author of Krivda, the God Tricks Against the Matrix, she addresses everything you're talking about mm -hmm. with great intensity. And she's a woman and she's a smart one. And she's got a lot to say that I think you'll find very interesting. In fact, her book's very hard to get. If you email me your shipping address, I will send you a copy of it. I love that. And she will read it by Tuesday. I mean, it, it, it's... Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> well the, the, the four podcasts go through it in great detail. So I think you'd find that fascinating. But Megan, since what you, ha you are here, which I'm finding quite interesting and valuable, um, because I love hearing the woman's side of things. You know, I have two wives, so I'm, I'm a man who really appreciates women. Um, what is the difference between driven men and driven women? And how does the difference play out in gender roles? I'd, I'd, I'd like to hear that from you as a woman. And I'd also like to hear what a good man is. Mm. 
Doug and I have spent a ton of time on divine feminine and divine masculine lately, but I'll answer your, your first question first. Um, we, we kind of went down this road of pursuing driven women specifically. And we have a driven women's group because there, there was maybe two pages in the book that spoke specifically to driven women. It was very, uh, you know, Doug didn't, I don't think had a lot of data points at that point. Um, and we would get emails and, and outreach from people saying, I really identify with this. I feel like women are missing from it. So we have jumped into that full force and Doug has been amazing and curious. And in, in our experience, or at least in my experience, so much of it is just a different flavor of the same thing based on society, based on culture. So um, we have a lot of the same traits, tendencies, and behaviors but they're received differently. Um, you know, it, uh, women who are, um, risk takers might be perceived differently because it's women are usually the ones that are more cautious. So we, we feel, um, we feel shame in different areas about different things. Um, because a lot of it is like, well, will the herd accept a woman who is like this? Um, and we find that women identify with that part a lot. Um, the, the shame associated with, I'm not, I don't do a good job at being a woman because of these traits. And it's the, the woman that society is kind of feeding, serving to us. I, I do air bunnies on the woman part. You mean what you're saying is the woman society's feeding to us is not a driven woman. Therefore you're in a non-consensus reality if you're a driven woman. Right. Yeah, I think, you know, like you say, it's true for both men and women, but, you know, we have a lot of um, confusion on gender roles going on in the world right now, as you both are surely aware, but we also have, we have about four plus thousand years of patriarchy where women have been seriously diminished. And my God, if there's a religion that just makes a mess out of women, it's Christianity. I say to people all the time, how could any woman become a Christian if she studies the history of that religion? That's like stepping right into uh, the lion's den begging for problems and marrying a man who is raised in that religion is guaranteed in most cases to be some kind of pathological relationship. Um you know, in, in all fairness, not all Christians are that way and not all branches of Christianity are that way, but the majority of it is built on that ideology. And, and it, you know, I won't go into the history of it because I've studied it extensively and it could be 10 podcasts and, and, a, and a retorts book goes into it very well. But I, I think that, I think we're at a time in the world where the paradox is we actually need a lot more driven women to inspire the women in the herd to step up into their power. Because if we don't start moving toward a matriarchal or a, at least a, a society of equality between the men and the women, our days are numbered because some crazy Klaus Schwab or Novel Harari or uh, Bill Gates or Fauci, who's really not really much of a man to me, he's a coward, but it's going to take one of these guys to trigger off a third world war or something. And so we don't get some, you know, the woman's uh, oriented toward nurture and holding the family together and the community together. And we've got all this hardcore masculinity at the top, a bunch of eff effeminate males now from all sorts of factors from processed food to video games to you name it. So they're just laying around with their tail between their legs. So I, I think we need, you know, like a woman that really I have a lot of respect for is Kelly Brogan because she gets out there. She tells the truth. She's not afraid of men. She's smarter than 99% of them. Um, you know, my wife, Penny, is like one of the most intelligent people I know of in the world and has a tremendous capacity for bringing feminine and masculine together. My other wife, Angie, is a very powerful woman, very feminine, very loving mother, but also a real ass kicker, go get it, and won't put up with any bullshit from people. So I think we're in this 
mythical transition where we're moving out of a patriarchal, out of a capitalist, um, consumerist, materialist society into something else, or we're going to kill each other and the planet, but we can't do it without the women. So, you, you know, Megan, what would you say to a woman that, that has the drive to get involved, but needs to be cautious that she doesn't create as much problems for herself trying to be the medicine as she does good for everybody else? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one thing Doug and I have talked about is that toxicity goes both ways and it's, it's trying to separate masculine from feminine when one begets the other, they're critical to each other. Um, so there's, you know, it's, it's not the, the patriarchy sucks. So feminism, feminine is the answer. It's there, there has to be a better balance and a, a give and take, and there has to be appreciation for the divine side of both. Um, and then I don't, what's Doug, what's the book? Um, the Fisher King and the Handless Maiden, where it talks about yeah, the Robert deep Johnson. Things, yeah, of masculine and feminine. Um, and a lot of the, and this is where I'll answer your question about what is a good man. A lot of the bucketing that I've done for bad man, bad man is actually probably just wounded man uh -huh. um, and things that happen out of wounds and they're not channeling that divine masculine. Um, because the divine masculine is good. Being protected does feel good. You know, a, a strong man with frame is good, feels good. Um, but the, we associate, we love to bucket things and simplify and, and make things dual. So we associate bad behavior by a man as masculine behavior yes. instead of that was behavior done by a man who was wounded and and there are women attacked in business for being you know bitches and it's not because they're women it's because they're demonstrating wounded masculine behavior and they would mm -hmm. do just as well as any successful man if they can channel and value and utilize some of that feminine partnership and flow and love and nurturing that doesn't make them weak right right no it's it, it, for me. It's a fundamental misunderstanding about the dynamics of masculine feminine, not the gender role masculine feminine. Right. They're so overlapped, and you know, well, I'm in my masculine. Like that doesn't make sense. You know, it, it, it's it it's really a deeper understanding is what's needed. And I tell you what, in the last two years of watching Megan. I have no doubt anywhere in my 54 year old body with two PhDs that women are smarter and better and more insightful <laughs> and more in reality than men. I'm not kidding you. Well, it's well known in research. Uh, the average woman does four to five times as much work a day as the average men. They have 30% more commissorial fibers connecting the left and right brain hemispheres. So imagine if I gave you a video game that was you know, 30% more powerful or a computer with 30% more processing power, you certainly wouldn't go back to your old one unless you were just a fool. This is probably the right place to talk about this. This So drivens in general are way more empathetic, meaning that we can read the room, read other people's emotions much better. And at the same time, what happened theoretically as we went from little hunter gatherer groups of 40 to these 400,000, 4 million, 4 billion societies, most farmers domesticated have put the protection off on someone else. Yes. And so it is this, you know, dorsal bagel, our gut system, our gut wiring system is fight or flight. Yeah. And it's the herding system, meaning that. You know, you have a herd of gazelles and a cheetah runs into the herd. What do they do? Is they scatter. Yes. Fuck you and you're on your own. And there's so much of that within society that me as a driven that is craving and I grab my heart to, to I grab my ventral vagal. I am so desperately in need of people that really have my back. And I deal, you know, with the Navy SEALs, all the team guys that I've worked with and all the military guys that I've worked with that truly know what that brotherhood attachment is like. 
miss it to the core. And as driven people, this is what almost killed me. And it does wrap into driven women. Driven As a driven person, I've always had this aching aloneness feeling since I was little. And mm-hmm. it is a desperate need to have a wolf pack. People, and this is the difference between a wolf pack and a herd, what happens when a bear attacks a wolf in a wolf pack? The whole pack gets the bear. I got your back, man. And that that is what all drivens are desperately craving. Mm-hmm. Is that real soul to soul connection? And you know, we're so burned by often many people that aren't driven like us that, you know, oh, I got your back until things get scary. Well, yeah. And look at look at what the whole pandemic did. All sorts of people that claim to be yogis and health experts and even doctors that were educating people on the dangers of these very issues flipped over and caved in and became part of the herd. So you, you, you see, there's, there's just like so little backbone in, in a lot of people. And I think this is part of the product of when people intellectually evolve, but don't authentically evolve. In other words, you got a bunch of spiritual ideas and talk but as soon as you got to face the dragon you cave in and 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 i think for me that was a real sign that um you know when when you have enough stress you lower down in your value structure and you also go, you recede in your conscious evolution so you go back closer to being you go from being an independent free thinker to looking for someone to tell you what to do like a mommy or a daddy figure to then becoming a codependent, to then becoming a total dependent, like someone that's sick and broken and can't contribute anymore. But it takes a fair bit of courage to say, I am going to think and act affirmatively because not only is this dangerous for me, it's dangerous for everybody. And and that's really what the nature of a real soldier is, is knowing how to face death and danger without caving in for the pure understanding that if you don't do it, then the people that are not soldiers, which are the ones you're protecting, have to face the enemy that they're not trained to face, which means annihilation. Women are more courageous than men. I can tell you that. Well, shit, I can tell you how to prove that. Just go stand right there while they're giving birth to a child and ask yourself, could I handle that? Well, the answer for every man is absolutely not. Nope. It's a physiological fact, um, and and I've been there three times, and believe me, I am so freaking glad that I have a male body that I look at women and go, how would you ever want to do that twice? <laughs> and I've, I've worked watching driven women embrace what they really are on that soul level is just absolutely the most priceless thing I've ever experienced watching my daughters and learning from the Megans in the world, how to embody this for them that I'm here to protect and serve them and to watch them feel in that safety, their souls. I mean, they're little badasses. (laughs) It's like, like they're not timid, scared little creatures. They're badasses. They just think a lot more clearly than men and they see a lot more risk than men. But they, yeah, they're, 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 they're different. They're, they're not timid. <laughs> I'm just making it's not timid. Well, I got a f- fireball in the brew. My little girl is just a absolute friggin' tiger. I'm just, I'm meditating now on what I'm going to do when she gets to be a teenager. Cause I'm swear to God, it's going to be like releasing Joan of Arc into the public or something, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Many of you are aware of the importance of magnesium, but very few are aware that most of the magnesium products out there are not high quality and seldom do what they say they'll do on the bottle or the package. But Bioptimizers has produced the most comprehensive magnesium breakthrough product on the market. I've got Wade here to tell us a little bit about it. Wade, what makes your magnesium breakthrough product so unique? 
Well, I think because we combine a variety of magnesiums. In fact, we use seven different types. So if you look at all the research papers out there, you'll see that they'll use various magnesiums, whether it's orotate, malate, you know, sucrosomial is a hot one that's just come out recently. And they're rated on bioavailability. But the biggest component that a lot of people don't understand with magnesium is that different types of magnesium are uptaken by different parts of the body or different organs, some in your brain, some in your nervous system, some are vasodilators. And so there's a variance in people's responses depending on what they need magnesium for. So we went out to try and solve this problem by combining all seven of the best magnesiums into one single capsule, which was very difficult because number one, the bonding size was different. The nozzles for the machines wouldn't work. We don't use any fillers or uh, chemical uh, excipients, the flow regulators. And then we got them in the caps and the caps rose. We had to do special light caps. But when we solved all those problems and turned it out for ourselves because we were tired of buying, you know, I had a whole counter full of magnesiums. Well, guess what? A lot of people said this was the best magnesium product they've ever taken. And after being in this business for 18 years, it's quickly moved to our number one selling product in Bioptimizer history. What are just two or three things that magnesium is really supportive of? I know sleep challenges is one of them. What are some of the other key issues? Well, it acts as a down regulator for your nervous system to kind of help you relax and go into, you know, out of fight or flight. And that's the biggest factor, especially today in a, in a high blue light electromagnetic frequency world that we find ourselves in a high stimulus environment. It's also critical for vasodilation and vasodilation increases blood flow. And many times when we are suffering from a variety of pain or conditions in the body, it's because we're not getting oxygen in or toxins out of those tissues. And you've written a lot about it in your work. And so magnesium breakthrough, because it's so powerful and not available uh, in most North American diets because of what we've done with farming. Uh, it's a great way to augment your diet and it's easy to get. You go to magnesiumbreakthrough.com or magbreakthrough.com slash living 4D. You can get a 10% discount and it's a money back guarantee. If it's not the best magnesium you've ever taken, you get your money back. Mag, M-A-G, breakthrough.com, magbreakthrough.com forward slash living 4D. And is there a discount for the listeners? 10% all for right. all the listeners. All right. Give it a go, you guys. Everything I use from Bioptimizers is the best I've ever used. That's why I love Wade and Bioptimizers. So you've heard how it's made, why it's made, and how it works. If you want the best, go get it. Well, I got you here, Doug. You got a PhD, two PhDs in psychology. Um if you had to give us a diagnosis on some of these highly driven men that are behind what's going on in the world from the Great Reset to everything we all know is going on, what would be your analysis of, of these types of people and what tips do you have for the rest of us to manage the stress of being exposed to the dark drive of such people? Yeah, so psychopathology, most driven are sociopathic, meaning that we we can see how the rules are constructed for most people, but we don't necessarily believe they apply to us. If they make sense, I'll do them. But otherwise, I, you know, I'm smart enough to know that I don't need your laws to make me safe. Um, but drivens, as it gets farther down the path, and you, you see this really deep psychopathology, they have a soul sickness. Yes, I agree. And that, that soul sickness is, you know, they're driven and they're deeply detached from the goodness in their soul. Do I believe they're unreachable? I've met two in my life that I truly, this person here is a reptile, they have no soul. All the other thousands of people I've met, you can, you can touch those moments where it does shake them to their core, but... You know, they they have to have a real clear understanding that that that's what really matters. You know, when you're on your deathbed, the only thing you give a shit about is was I loved and did I love? Yeah. How many? You know, how Putin is just a driven, and he thinks he's you know, he thinks having Ukraine is going to make him a better man or whatever. I don't give a shit what it is. 
Do you think self-righteousness plays into it or like extreme self-righteousness that they don't realize it's self? Yes. They think it is self, small self. They get lost in their own emotions, their own narratives. They just believe their own narratives. And narcissism is a very, and I studied a lot of Almas. I love A.H. Almas and his, his point of existence, you know, the transformation of that narcissism, but really understanding how their wounds are pre-verbal. And, you know, here's my psychology PhD thing, meaning that their, their wounded soul happened to them prior to their neo, to their Broca's Wernicke's areas coming online in their brain. So they don't even have words for what they're trying to do. They just know that power makes them feel important and they're just running at it. Yeah, it's if you look at some of the documentaries on Bill Gates's father and, and you know, it becomes pretty easy to see the apple hasn't fallen far from the tree. But as a psychologist, let me just put it to you this way. If I came to you as a child and said, this is the nature of my father. And, and it was these type of guys. Or if I came to you and said, I'm in a schoolyard where the principal is abusive, controlling, is raping people, beating them up. How would you, I'm asking you, how do we as a world populace deal with about a hundred of these psychopaths that are highly driven into the darkness and are probably all experiencing very, very serious core wounds, but don't realize it. Um, there's that aspect of it. But then if you, I can't remember which book it is by James Hollis. It's about the soul, but he has a chapter in there called, I think it's called the bad soul. And he says, some souls are just born dark. They just are right out of the gate. No matter how well they're raised or loved, they're just, they come out dark. So there's some deep, complicated stuff. And I know that this is a deep question, but you got two PhDs, so you have no excuse. You got to give it to us, baby. So that, yeah. And it, it's Jonathan Haidt did a wonderful exploration in this called the, the Righteous Mind about what we believe to be our value. And is, if it's, if you're stuck in those loops, Never questioning your soul. Right. Bad, bad news right there. Bad news. Because it, it, I fundamentally believe that we are animals. And fundamentally, all human beings, when they're scared, become very selfish. Therefore, all people are equally bad as good. It's fear is what creates this real sense of fuel towards, I need more. I think that's why spiritual development is so important. And one of the things is if you study the history of the patriarchal leaders is they got spirituality out of religion and corporatized religion as a control system. Yep. But spirituality in its authentic form is beautifully described by the symbol of the minotaur, the animal with the man's body. And so the, the head of the Minotaur is human, which means he has transcended the animal. Mm -hmm. But the below part is the animal that, that is our biological drives. It's the body we're in. It gives us the opportunity as a soul to have these experiences that we're having and gives us something to grow past and through. And, you know, the body is extremely beautiful. I mean, what would sex be like without a body? It would, it would be nothing. Um, dancing wouldn't be any fun without a body. There's a million things that a body really makes beautiful. But we, we've we really got a very huge deficit for spiritual development worldwide, largely due to brainwashing and control dramas from school to religion, etc. And so what happens is you get exactly this sort of thing where people associate themselves or unconsciously live in their animal psyche. And, and so you could say my, my paratrooper urge to go kick ass and enter the battle is really the fear of the animal in me wanting to defend itself like a wolf going after the bear. But then the head of the Minotaur is saying, 
there's always going to be bears and you're better to outsmart them than to try to lower yourself to that level and become the bear because you're now you you haven't really transcended anything you've only made it to next week so to speak i agree the 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 way i teach it is that there's nothing i can do about my impulses other than catch them before they turn into behaviors well that's doing something positive it's it, it it's the reason i'm not living in a car <laughs> because it is this flesh versus spirit yeah and you know the spirit is my soul and this beingness yes rather than acting in reflexive shitty behaviors based in fear you know ultimately only god can give a soul and if god is unconditional love then the quest for the soul is ultimately to learn to live and experience and give unconditional love which is extremely hard to do but i believe a lot of the problem that we have in the world with with consumerism is that we're constantly looking for something to feed the emptiness within us whether it be food sex drugs video games um almost Life every distraction color. you can think of right but ultimately what I've learned through my own spiritual development is that I feel the most satiated when I'm doing things in my life that ultimately enhance the lives of other people. And I think if we oriented ourselves less towards how much money we make or how much rank and power we have, or you know whether we've got the cool icon or we live in the right neighborhood or drive the right car to be considered successful, if we oriented ourselves, I mean, look, uh, I've got a great book here called The Web of Meaning by Jeremy Lent. This is a phenomenal book that I think both of you would be very impressed with. Oh, well, that looks cool. It's a very good book. He's a very good author. He's very well studied in world religion and many, many other things. But, you know, he statistically states that right now there's 4 billion people in the world that make less than $7 a day and cannot meet their survival needs. So when I look at all these billionaires, you know, one billionaire was created, what, every 30 minutes or something since COVID started? It's something ridiculous. Oh, wow. And you've got Bill Gates with $165 billion. I'm like, if we could get some of these people to realize how much more enriched their lives would be by genuinely helping others instead of running um, philanthropic scams to trick people. Um, I, I think if we oriented ourselves towards realizing we all need the same things, and that is we all need earth that's healthy, water that's healthy, food that's healthy, air that's clean. And, and people to, that have our back. And to share our geniuses, our talents, our talents, our, our ethnic, ethnic diversity. I mean, what would music be like if it was only one way? Or food be like if it was only one way? Or religion would be like if it was only one way? But now, since COVID started, we've got all this racial segregation. We've got all this pitting people in the family against each other. And, and people have fallen right into this trap, which is classic brainwashing to divide people. But what if we really realized, okay, no matter what your opinion is on, on politicians or on whether you should get vaccinated or not, if we put caring for each other and the planet as our first priority, and said, what would happen to all these disease statistics and all these comorbidities if we just got back to caring for each other? Well, it would probably put the standard medical system out of business. People would start to think again. They would start to dance and sing. They wouldn't need video games because they would enjoy drumming, dancing, singing, painting, playing, and being alive and being human. I think, I think it's going to take everyone with at least two PhDs or more and all the guys like me that figured it out the hard way 
to, to really lead people into the realization that anybody that tells you to segregate is not aware of what health is on any level, right. physical, emotional, mental, or spiritual, and that we've all got to protect each other because to follow a law or a mandate that's criminal by definition is a criminal activity. Oh, I, I what I always have, well, <clears throat> I've deduced it takes, it's going to take about a hundred driven women with a unified voice agreeing on what the truth is from all different backgrounds, from all different. And then that unified voice will be heard. Yeah. I think it's coming. It's coming. That's why they're censoring so much. You can always tell who's important because they censor them. <laughs> oh, I think it's going to be painful. I think, I think any transformation is not without challenge. So we, no. like you, you, when you said like, if people cared for people and, that it would disrupt the medical system, like in the moment that that happens, that will feel very painful. Being cared for or the disruption? No, the disruption to the way society is currently operating. There'll be a lot of pushback. There'll be a lot of, why, why don't you care that people are losing their jobs? Like, I think we, we envision it to be very euphoric, but a transformation is uncomfortable. It is. And the problem is the paradox of it is Research shows that 75% of Americans hate their job. So losing your job when you hate your job shouldn't be so painful. But the problem is, is that our education system has got creativity right the hell out of us. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah. it's unfamiliar for them. Right. I, I, I watched all sorts of even people that I've trained go into bankruptcy and all sorts of stuff with COVID. And I said, why didn't you just reinvent yourself? Why didn't you? start coaching people on the internet. And they just looked at me with a blank stare, like, oh, I, I don't know how to do that. I'm like, well, shit, you know how to starve right now. You know how to take handouts. You know how to lower yourself to the lowest common denominator. If you're a student of mine and you're smart enough to assess a human body, you should have been smart enough to be creative. So pull your head out of your fourth point of contact and learn how to use social media and share the love because love is a boomerang. If you don't put any out, nothing comes back. Yeah. And it, it's the internet is the Gutenberg printing press all over again. 1439. It, it took about 40 years for the wars to really get rocking and rolling. It'll probably be about the same here. But what, what happened was very simply is the, you, you can't run it, run a bullshit scam if everybody knows about it. <laughs> I know. And so it's just a matter of time. But the men always seem to have an angle. And I know that's a very sexist thing. What do you mean by an angle? Hidden agenda. We're very prideful men on general speaking. And it's very hard for us to sit and do nothing. Well, I don't sit and do anything, uh, do nothing. Do you? I do. 20 minutes every day. Well, <clears> that's, that, yeah, that, that's, that's not doing nothing though. That's doing it's something. Trying to do nothing. <laughs> it, it's right. But it is. It, that's a that. nothing. That's something. Doing nothing is watching the world fall apart and eating junk food and staring at your video game and going, oh, I don't know and what not, to do. And, and not feeling it. Or not yeah. allowing yourself to feel it. Yeah. Feel it. And that is the piece that I think is is the key to to really unlocking, as you said, you got to get people to feel how shitty it really is. Yeah. Now, here's an interesting question for you, uh, and, and you know, either of you can answer, um, but I'll give you the question and let you wrestle over who goes at it, or both of you can. <laughs> when a woman goes through menopause, her testo her testosterone rises relative to estrogen. And if she has a younger husband whose estrogens haven't risen because his testosterone's still high, it can make for some interesting experiences because now you have two people wearing the pants trying to control the activities of the house. What happens if both of them are driven? <laughs> that's not unique to menopause. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, uh, uh, that's possibly <laughs> true. But uh, having worked with a lot of driven women, going through menopause and their husbands, I've seen how, you know, if you get a woman that's like 10 years older than a man and her man's a fairly fit, healthy male, 
as she starts becoming more domineering and controlling, then there's a lot of conflict. And I've had to do a lot of relationship counseling to help people through that. But typically, you can see, but it's not as common to have too highly driven. Usually, I find driven women more often couple themselves with men that are um, more, not necessarily feminine in a negative sense, but more receptive to her drive. Um, you know, Penny's a very driven woman, but she's receptive to my drive and she uses her drive to take my education and bring it out to the world and run a worldwide organization and, you know, do a lot of things that would drive me completely loopy so that her drive doesn't conflict with my drive. So I'll ask Megan directly. How have you taught Matt to listen to you? How did you do it before versus now? <laughs> yeah. I, um, when I first, uh, for the first several years I was married, I had a, a frequently recurring nightmare where I was screaming at my husband and he didn't hear me or he was ignoring me. Um, and in the last two years of kind of working with Doug, um, uh, have you ever read She by Robert Johnson? Just briefly, I have it. It's on my high priority list to read. I've got all of his books. I study a lot of his work. Excellent book on on the women's development, but it talks about um, psyche and Aphrodite and um, that. Psyche being this little, sweet, innocent girl that just wants to play with Barbies and be cuddly and fun at tea parties. And then Aphrodite, who's kick-ass take names. Yes. Yeah. I will cut you. Yeah. So it, it's the, I laugh because that increase in testosterone or maybe the, the fight for control presents in women, I think a lot as that Aphrodite and in the story, um, Psyche, her sisters, which are the voices in our heads, her sisters tell, convince her that her husband Eros is an evil snake monster and he's going to eat their firstborn child, that he's a bad man. Um, so Psyche goes with a knife to see his face because she hasn't asked these questions of him before and and kill him. Um, and then when she raises the lantern, when she illuminates who he really is, she recognizes that he is a god and he's beautiful and she doesn't kill him. So for a long time, when I wanted to be heard, I just brought the knife and I just said, you're dumb. I'm right. Stab, stab, stab. Um, and in the last couple of years, understanding a little bit more about that dynamic, that necessary flow of feminine and masculine, bringing a lantern to conversations instead um, and illuminating uh, the, the divine man that he is and holding him accountable to that through asking questions, being curious, being gentle and surrendering. So that's really bringing your feminine nature out. Mm -hmm. And and I it's I don't know a whole lot about the the actual biology of of menopause and estrogen and testosterone and how that relates. But psychologically, yes, I think that that we encounter driven couples really frequently who have either had like trauma bonding or they like for my husband and I it was both like you can run just as fast as me. Cool, let's run together. Um, but it, he's, it a, came, he's a professional athlete too. He was, yeah. He it was came with a lot of conflict. It came with a lot of butting of heads on, on who was right. And who was, uh, we would fight over all the time when we had our first child, who would get to stay late at work and who was going to go home. Um, and, and understanding that there's not weakness in that femininity. Um, and that you can express your drive in other ways, but you still, in order to have that relationship, have to find the flow. And I think that's why a lot of driven women, um, you know, tend toward more feminine men sometimes because you still need the yin and yang. Yeah. Any comments, Doug? I rambled a little bit on that one. No, no, it's okay. I, th I think it was important. Yeah, unbelievably important in that women demanding more power in their in their relationship is the wrong direction women owning their power right that they already have 
Yeah. The power is in that divine feminine of stillness, of softness, of curiosity, of kindness. And I, it, it driven <laughs> all women out there and your husbands will motherfuck me for this one. But when my wife walks in and says, I know you're a wonderful, phenomenal father and, and husband, but I'm fucked. <laughs> well, but <laughs> means forget everything I said until I use the word, but. <laughs> And it, it's, it's in that moment, though, that she is really illuminating the part of me that is divine and the part of me that is I would die to protect and serve my wife. Well, if she if you wouldn't, you married the wrong woman. Right. But that that she sees that in me. And this is what it took me as a dumbass man. And that <laughs> Megan gets to explain that one. How stupid men really are. You had no idea, did you? No, we assume like <clears throat> we assume that you see what we see, that you have access to all of the things that we do um, and that you are choosing to ignore or or, you know, not pay attention. And when we get in a mode of fear or that, you know, masculine motivation, we try to control and feminine power isn't about control. And, it, and so it is this this divine feminine that comes up and is so that is the strongest part of a woman the strongest part of anyone is that true i can hold myself through childbirth and know that i'm going to be okay men are like fuck i don't know i had but I, we have no reference for that because we have to cultivate that own and it's stereotypical some men are born with more softness than others but it's something that i've struggled with in all driven people is to to teach them the power of gentleness yeah i think that's why tai chi and qigong um particularly were were so pivotal for me hmm. um i did 18 years of daily tai chi and qigong wh whichever form i chose but um i found that without it i was going to just burn myself out and it um, tremendously enhanced my capacity for empathy just because it brought me to such a place of stillness that I was like, I was like a violin string that was sensitive to the vibration of everything around it. Whereas before, when I was training so hard and pushing so hard, I had to toughen up. And it was like the string got tighter and tighter and tighter till it took a hurricane to vibrate it uh, for any other reason than its arrow pointed focus. And because it's a life force cultivating practice, it gave me the strength to get a lot of work done and, and do a lot of things that were ultimately very meaningful to me and, and have been helpful to a lot of people. So I think. I think the inner arts, and in my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, I don't know if you've seen it, but I have zone exercises in there, which is really simple forms of, of Tai Chi and Qigong that anybody can do, but they bring you into yourself and they leave you with more vitality, but you always leave them with a clearer head and a sense of calmness. And most of the things that we engage in in our modern world they they take our energy and vitality outside. So I see what's happening to a lot of people is what I call externalization of the self, identifying yourself as what you're doing, how much money you're making, everything outside of you. But I think men and women both today need to come into their center and have time every day to just be in and with themselves. Because if you don't learn to have empathy for yourself, it's really hard to have empathy for anybody else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, learning to hold myself, develop and cultivate my own feminine is, is, I too have done buckets of that. And otherwise, my drive will kill me. And you crying, Megan, crying on your yoga mat for two, three weeks. How have you learned to develop stillness? Um, <clears throat> by recognizing that it's, uh, 
it it can be uncomfortable and you sit in it anyway. That's interesting. For me, since we're talking about it, and that's a very common comment I get, you know, I've taught thousands of people all sorts of inner arts. I find that the discomfort only happens when you're trapped in it. So I teach a technique called the lifeguard tower. I say, when you go to meditate or do Tai Chi or any of these inner arts, climb up to the top of the lifeguard tower and see the activities of your mind like the people on the beach. But don't be like the lifeguard that gets so enamored by the two girls French kissing each other that you forget the boy that's drowning in the rip current out there. Mm. The point is the two girls kissing is your thoughts, your feelings, and your emotions that are your ego's games and follies. But when you sit on the lifeguard tower and you say, ah, oh, look, there's a couple girls making love. There's a couple guys getting a little too drunk over there. There's somebody arguing with their wife and nobody's dying. So I don't have to worry about it. It's just people being people. So by taking the lifeguard position and witnessing what's going on in your mind, like you're watching a movie, you learn to detach from it. And by getting that healthy form of detachment from the ego, the ego starts losing its power and control over you. And you start centering yourself in the soul essence, which mm -hmm. is the divine witness. Ultimately, the soul is the witness. The ego is, is the show that gives it experience or something to engage in for growth. Um, so I share that as, as a, an offering to everybody because it is very common for people to really wrestle with stillness or, or trying to hold still, but there's no more of an IMAX theater than there is right between your ears. But if you get caught in the role, you end up being like people that throw televisions out the window because their team lost the Super Bowl and they kill the mother and father walking 40 stories down below the hotel. Hmm. You know, so I think it's very important at this time in, in the world for all of us to take at least five or six minutes a day at minimum to just be able to love ourselves enough to be with who and what we really are, which is what's watching the show, not what's caught in the show. That's really like a figment of our imagination. But, you know, if you get caught in the figments of your imagination, you become a fanatic or you become a um, proselytizer or you become a, um, a pain in the ass. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you become somebody that people don't enjoy being around. Hi, everybody. I'm super excited to share one of my favorite Symbiotica products called the Omega. This is an amazing product. When I tried it the first time and every time, I found it very calming and very centering. And the immediate thought I had is that this product is great for people that are under a lot of stress and have busy minds. So I asked Sherveen to come tell us what's unique about this amazing product, the Omega. Well, the fish oil industry is running havoc across the world, destroying our mother nature and providing oxidized omega-3 oils to so many people that just don't know. So and a lot of the fish is toxic too. Super toxic. I mean, you're getting homeopathic doses of mercury, heavy metals, pesticides, plastics. I can go on and on if you understand homeopathy, which you do. And so we wanted to circumvent that. And guess what? Fish don't make DHA and EPA. They don't synthesize it. They're eating little sea creatures that are feeding on microalgae. Right. So what did we do? We went to the cleanest place on earth, Nova Scotia, to extract a wild heirloom strain of algae with warm water. So it's still intact. It's still alive. And from there, we took other microalgae, including one called astaxanthin, which we now know is the strongest antioxidant on earth. You know, it's that pigment that makes flamingos pink yes. or makes salmon red. Yeah. So we get that directly sourced from Iceland. You can see it in all my videos, me going through the whole growth facility. It's incredible stuff. I didn't stop there. We added organic lemon terpenes. We added phosphatidylcholine. We, we used organic sea buckthorn oil, which is omega-3, 6, 7, and 9. This is one 
powerhouse Omega product, never been done before. This is a flagship to Symbiotica, and it's an honor to be able to provide this product to so many mothers and children and everyone across the board. Yes. In fact, you know, my son's a high energy kid that doesn't like to sleep at night. So one of the first things that come out of the refrigerator is the Omega to calm my mana down. And mana means life force. So, hey, you guys, this is really top-notch stuff. I love it. I feel fantastic when I use it. So get on over to C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A.com. And on checkout, use your code, capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, uh, 15. That's check 15 to get your discount. And while you're there, check out all the other absolutely amazing products. And as always, love to hear your feedback. My next question is a large percentage of my patients and life coaching clients are highly driven elite athletes, many X Games competitors, elite motocross racers, you know, people that are on the very edge of life and death all the time. And a pattern I find among them is that unless they're pushing themselves to the limit, riding the razor's edge between life and death, the world seems very uh, flat and slow and boring to them. And this often leads to them, you know, often having to trigger challenges and relationships to bring their adrenaline back up or getting a little bit or a lot out of hand with drugs. And unfortunately, now that psychedelics are on the return, there's a lot of people uh, really messing themselves up with what should be a spiritually uh, used practice. And then they have, I've seen endless wild sexual pursuits, divorces, broken families, addictions, unnecessary injuries, anxiety, depression, and unfortunately, sometimes suicide. And my observation is that their escape route from uh, unresolved pain and in their developmental years and, and a lack of ability to fit into society, um, it's therapeutic for them to, to, to do what they're doing, but they they initially got love and attention. I see this with a lot of, I've worked with a lot of childhood prodigy athletes. And so what happens is they get a lot of love and attention, and mom and dad just rah, rah, rah until they don't win or they don't do good. And then they go into your mode of shame, which was applicable in this instance. And then they have to succeed. And then they come again. In fact, I'll give you a case. I can't obviously mention names, but I was working for let's just say the most famous rugby team in the world. One of their top players for three years had had a, a hamstring injury that kept him out of doing his work to the potential that was expected of him. And when I did my analysis on him, what I found is that he was getting so much pressure from the media all the time to rescue the team in the last minute when they were down and things like that, that ultimately he couldn't take the pressure. So what had happened is he had psychologically held on to this injury because as long as he was injured, he had an excuse as to why he couldn't rescue the team. So it was quite a shocking experience for him, for me to analyze that and, and identify that. But really, what it pointed to was too much expectation from people, too much pressure, and too much of his own identity crisis. Because if he could not perform at that level every time, then he felt like he had let everybody down. And then, of course, that leads to issues of payment and all sorts of complications. But really, what I worked with him on is something very simple. You know, even though you're a professional athlete, you get paid. The reason you got into this is because of the game and because of the play of it. And it is a play. You know, you're on a stage, you are playing a game. And if you go into it knowing that you did the best you can do, there's nothing anyone else can ex expect from you. And to expect yourself to do more than the best you can do is really a form of self-torture and, and probably treating yourself the way your father treated you. So th there's often a, a lot of coaching that has to go with that, because even though an athlete like that can understand that logically, it takes quite a lot of work to transform out of that and come into your center. And the paradox is when 
a person like that finds their center and begins to play again, guess what happens? They start playing really well. I'm curious, what are your thoughts when you have these types of people that are so jacked up on adrenaline and have come to be so driven that they can't deal with the world unless they're riding the edge of life and death or, or you know, pushing the thing to the extreme all the time. That is, that is my day every day. <clears throat> well, um, good. You should have some good answers then. <laughs> it comes down to identity. And it, it is, as you teach, the shift from the intellectual shift from identifying with people, places, things, objects, achievements, whatever, titles, to your soul. Well, yeah. that's not you. You're this. Right. It rolls right off the tongue. But that is the beginning of the work. That is where the work begins. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> embodying this way of being. And I, I will say that our souls are driven. My soul craves freedom, craves betterment, craves mastery. And it is. The only time I felt completely alive still where my soul and body become one what i call flow and it's where you're not up in your thinking you're not but you you're not completely present you're right on the edge of presence that's what i call it that is where my soul and my body become one i think a great path to that just to interject quickly is is this might be counterintuitive for a lot of people but i know that for me having passionate sex with somebody that I really love, mm -hmm. you know, when you can orgasm with somebody simultaneously, you lose yourself completely into the other person. And there's not you there. There's not them there. There's just something so expansive and so great that that I, I find that that can have a calming and centering effect that can last, you know, a week or more, depending on how intense the experience was. Um, the sad part of it is a, is a lot of people get wounded in their intimate relationships to the point where they don't feel like they want to give that other person themselves so fully anymore. So you end up having to defend yourself against the person that you married or the person you're in love with. And so it's a, it's this sort of paradoxical situation, but I, I bring that up because that's something that most people enjoy sex more than they enjoy meditating. And I think that if, if they realize that if they could leave the world at the door of the bedroom and really just engage the mystery of each other and not assume that you know the person, then sex can be a very powerful tool for, for healing, centering, and finding something greater than you within yourself that comes by way of love with the other. Finding something greater than you within yourself. Yeah. That comes by way of love with another. Yep. And it is, it's in that non-dual experience that you can touch the deepest parts of us. And in shortest terms, I mean, very simply, I used to say it a lot more to my drug addicts, but being wired the way I'm wired with this acute awareness of soul, acute awareness of hypocrisy, acute awareness that I'm, if it's, if it's going to lead to a soul expanding experience, I'm in, I have to learn how to change my identity to the soul. Otherwise, this life is so fucking painful for me. Because I feel so trapped in this mundane, stupid, boring, easy existence. My soul is crying out for something more. You're also at the age, Doug, where that's a natural transition for a couple of reasons. One, your testosterone levels drop 13% every 10 years after the age of 25. So at 54, 25, 35, 45, 55, 13 times three is what? Megan, <laughs> thirty-nine. You're thirty-nine percent down if you're, you know, 
if we just use the general spectrum, unless you're like me and you know how to pick it up naturally with heavy weightlifting. And, and uh, you know, I, I tell people all the time, the fastest, the best uh, anti-aging program is to stop acting old, <laughs> you know, um, I mean, and I mean with like, you know, when you go to the gym, you got to keep lifting like, like a young person, you got to, you got to stop making excuses and saying you don't have time and all that shit. But, um, my, my point that I'm bringing up for you is you're at the stage in your life, you know, a midlife crisis usually happens when someone's not listening to their soul and they keep creating something that's taking them further away. And there's an emptiness that grows in them so deep and so profound that it will overwhelm an individual to the point that they literally can um, lose the needle on their compass and have to go into a, a period of crisis to, to find help or there, or they may, well, they may just lose everything. They may just, not, not only that, they may even kill themselves. So I, I think for you at your age and for guy, a guy like me at 60, it's we're being called because the angel of death is starting to get closer. You know, there's no escaping that we're all going to go. So you, you, there's something inside of us says you better start doing your inner work or you're not going to know how to handle the, the grand finale. Um, but I'd love to hear either of you comment when you have these people that are so jacked that they can't ground themselves and, and participate, shall we say with the rest of us, what do you, what do you suggest for people like that? Cause there's a lot of them out there. Curiosity. Well, they already think they're curious. They're just very curious about the things that interest them, which is often not what interests their friends and family beyond the fact that they're supporting them to do it. So it takes some teaching to, to get to a place where you actually know what the what is going on inside of you. And that, you know, the, the lifeguard insight you know, your, your call to soul to observe yourself um, is a perishable skill. What do you mean by a perishable skill? Meaning that if I don't practice, it goes away. I, and so this wonderful thing happens to most of my clients when they first read my book or hear this stuff from Meg or me. Um, they go into something the Buddha called false enlightenment. All of a sudden, it's like, wow, I have great insight and I catch my impulses and oh my God, everything's different now and life's so great. Maybe I should buy a house and move. Um, and then they have to figure out, and this is why I've, I've witnessed it over the last 30 years, you know, the mindfulness movement coming through psychology every five, 10 years. People jump on that bandwagon for a year or two and then they find out it's fucking hard. Oh, yes. This is not, this is not like, oh, peace and love. No, this is learning how to sit in your shit. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah, at Alchemy, it's called cooking. You got to cook in it. Yeah. That's what I use that term all the time with my, with all my drivens. But it, it's because we, we do live in their world and we know what it's like to be completely alive. Most of these, most of your clients, my clients have downhill skiing or that one time they went up that one jump or the one where everything was perfect in the world. And they believe they have to change the outer environment to make that happen for their inner world. There, there can be some truth to that though, because if your outer environment um, doesn't support the inner journey, like if you're in a house, let's say you're 20, two-year-old athlete and you're surrounded by roommates that are playing heavy metal and, you know, smoking pot and banging around and you're trying to meditate. And it's like, you're in the middle of, of a New York city traffic jam with horns going off. It's very hard. So I think, I think we all have to be aware that our environment has a huge influence on us. I tell people, look, if you really want to take the inner journey, you got to create a sacred space in your home. I don't care if you empty out a, a, a closet and and put inspirational images, sculptures, a water fountain, incense, whatever it is, so that you can actually have a sacred space. 
and fill that with your chi. And each time you get to that deeper into yourself, it creates a resonance that permeates that space. I tell people always try to do your Tai Chi, your Qigong, or your meditation in the same place because that's holding the resonance of where you're at. And so it makes it easier to get there again and again. Um, so I understand what you're saying, but I, I do feel that we also need to be conscious that we are constantly um, a marriage with our environment. Like I, I can't work if my space isn't clean and organized. I got a lot of books around me, but I know everything's at. If someone moves it, it irritates me because I have a system in place. But anybody that comes here finds out real quick, don't leave handbags laying around. Don't leave socks on the floor. Don't leave your jacket laying on the couch because I, I don't like the clutter because I'm so sensitive to my environment because it's part of my mind. Right. Mm -hmm. and that, that intimate relationship you have with a reality environment. Yeah. That's a great way. That has been cultivated and developed. That did not come naturally to you, I promise. Well, it came through being a 12, 12 year old boy working for a NASCAR, uh, a NASCAR mechanic who built racing engines, and you could eat off every tool and you had to keep things organized. But then I was in the 82nd Combat Aviation Battalion working on $11 million helicopters all day, and you haven't seen organization until you've been inside of one of those hangars and also just all my training about everything. I have to be organized to analyze a human body. I get so much information. If it's not organized, then you just, you're just overwhelmed by it. And that, that, that is so critical for driven people. Cause remember we have occipital dominance. We see, we live in the environment that we're in. And, you know, is that an inner world reaction problem or an outer world problem of cleanliness and being able to discern that when I first start with somebody, the room's a mess. I'm a mess. The room is clean. Therefore, I'm clean, too. And it's like mm -hmm. it, it, it is this ability to see that there is an inner world and an outer world. And that was literally my doctoral dissertation that we Human beings are in a constant state of change. And part of them is working their ass off at keeping everything the same. Yes, yeah, so that's the ego. That is the ego. And that, that ability to see that my bridge between the inner world and outer world, and that, that is what I flip in people. Yes, and that's one of the things that makes spiritual development so demanding is because every step you go into spiritual development, you become something else. And the ego does not like that sense of, I don't know who I'm going to be if I keep doing this. And mm -hmm. that is, you just described my doctoral dissertation about why people sabotage is because the ego lives in the body. It does not live in your brain. Meaning that we have this recording device down here that knows the familiar. And if things are too good or too bad from that familiar, we start to get disorganized internally because we can't predict where the landmines are, or where the snakes are. And so if you're not changing the body, if you're not changing, you're not changing the reactivity of the ego. Yeah, there's a fusion for sure. Uh, I'm going to throw a scenario, Megan, to you. You're an elite athlete. You've got a lot of experience at elite athletics. You get called in as a consultant to a professional basketball team largely made of 19 to 25 year old uh drivens the coach says i need you to talk to these girls because they cannot relax they cannot focus and they're having a hard time getting along with each other and there's a lot of problems in their relationships I'm going to give you two hours to see what you can do with these girls. I'm curious, how are you going to handle this? Because this is exactly the issue I'm bringing up. You see, mm -hmm. how do, how are you going to teach them to harness their drivenness in ways that ultimately are effective for themselves and everybody involved, but yet know where the edges of it are and what they need to add to it, or it becomes 
the curse that once was their saving grace. Mm -hmm. I love this question because I do coach, not basketball, I coach volleyball, um, high school girls. Okay, volleyball is fine. Um, and Doug spoke at the beginning of this question um, about curiosity. And I'll, I'll uh, explain it a little more in that we invite curiosity specifically about what's going on in the body. So, I mean, we can, we can talk for days about the inner world and the outer world and all of the narratives that these girls have built up in their heads, which the narratives are probably affecting their relationships. The narratives are probably shaping whether that sensation in their body is excitement for the game or nervousness for the game. Because the sensation itself isn't that different, but the script that they're telling themselves is what's different. So I go back to being curious about the sensations in your body. Okay, you have your heart's beating fast, you have this churning in your stomach, you know, your palms are sweating. Like these are physical sensations and reactions of your body because you're about to go perform, you're about to go, you know. Uh, expend your energy and do what you've been training for months to do. And the fact that you're perceiving it as negative, you're perceiving it as nerves or I'm not good enough is all the, the narratives that you're building out of your identity. So I would take that two hours and invite them to exercises where they truly just first, first things first, you are safe. So any, anything you're, you're doing here you are safe and you need to recognize if it's fear motivated or I'm, I'm a uh, imposter motivated, you are safe. And this is supposed to be fun. And what's going on in your body. I actually have girls, athletes, excellent athletes who are such crippling perfectionists that they will choke because they have this expectation of being perfect. You know, when you play volleyball, you have to make mistakes. That's how someone wins the game. Otherwise the volley would go forever. So helping them understand that it's this identity, it's this expectation about the sensations in your body. That's, that's fucking you up. <laughs> Just go back to the sensations, accept them and then use them because you are talented. You do come to practice every day. You, your drive can help you win this game, but you have to get out of your head and back into your body. I make them go back and forth on their feet, feel your feet. And then we work all the way up the body. And they're just trying to be curious about the sensations instead of jumping so quickly to labeling them something negative. Right. So you're giving them something to work with that's tangible to them and isn't so out there that it's hard for them to connect to. And it doesn't have a ton of stories attached to it because girls, uh, girls love a good narrative and, and the relationship between girls on the court makes a big difference um, in winning or losing in team sports. So we have to simplify it down to something, you know, she's got something going on in her body, assume that, you know, and, and we work from there because once you can strip out all of the narrative and have them be curious about the emotions that all start with the sensation, then they, they feel a lot more in control of themselves and of what's going on. Yeah. Have you ever heard of Natalia Mamadova? No, that's a lovely name. She's the top year. She's one of the top volleyball players in the world for a long time. She's a Russian girl. She's huh. seven, seven foot one. She hired me to rehab her shoulders and she came in, uh, spent three weeks with me working with her privately. And I also worked with her in um, Sweden the year before that, but uh, that's a game. That's a brain. I'd love to pick on game strategy. Yeah. Well, she's <laughs> pretty full on. Uh, it's pretty interesting being next to a seven foot one tall woman. I'll tell you, mm -hmm. I've got a picture of her resting her elbow on my head and, it, and, <laughs> and, and I'm like this little tiny yeah. mannequin next to her. Oh man, she probably didn't have to jump to block. But her head was like three inches from the top of the net. Yep. She's quite an athlete. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So those are some good suggestions. So in summary, then be curious, pay attention to what you're feeling in your body and try to discern whether it's, uh, and this is my own words, you stress, useful stress or distress. And are you generating it? Or is it legitimate? Mm -hmm. If it's not legitimate, 
sit on your lifeguard tower, watch it, right, and say, I don't need to keep doing that to myself because it's not enhancing my performance, my relationships, or my well-being. Mm-hmm. That, that's my take on what you said. Do you accept that? Yes. And I, I get a lot of it from um, Thinking Body, Dancing Mind by Jerry Lynch and the other author is escaping me. Um, but he, he talks about just the the irony of the narratives and putting all that pressure on yourself and you re- reduce your performance. You make it worse. Yes. That's distress instead of useful yeah. stress. Yeah. So really recognizing that those sensations, I think Doug, the example Doug uses it a lot, um, is a roller coaster or what's the other thing you say, Doug? Cliff. Yeah. The body, it, the, the body, body doesn't know the difference between a roller coaster and a cliff. And so most people's central nervous systems are being run by their thinking. Yes, of course. And discernment between, is that your thinking? Is that your sensation? Or is that your soul? Mm-hmm. Yes. It's the basic work that I do with everybody. And it, it is, as Meg was saying, you know, everybody on the planet tends to make meaning out of these sensations. Uh-huh. Oh, that means that, that means that. And it, as I always laugh about, you know, it's a magic day in therapy when your therapist tells you you're full of shit. We're all completely full of shit when it comes to sensation thinking, meaning that we have a sensation we assume all kinds of crap about it. Yes. Feelings, you know, primates, animals, you know, why do we have feelings? Feelings are there to predict the future. They're also messages from your instincts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And it, that ability to reality test them is how I do it in my language. Your language, is it internal or is it external? Is, is it really, is there really a cave bear here? Is somebody going to eat you as you walk onto the volleyball court? No. Yeah, why do I feel this? It's because of your thinking, not because of reality. Yes. One what what of the things I see very consistently, even amongst world-class athletes, is that they have trained themselves to ignore their instincts. To put, for example, it's an instinct to rest. But if they're... Mm-hmm. If they've convinced themselves that they have to do more to get better, they ignore the instinct to rest. People yep. sitting on computers ignore the instinct to pee or to poop. And the next thing you know, they're having bladder infections and constipation. People ignore the instinct to breathe when they're emotionally stressed. And so they then become oxygen deprived and their whole body generates a fear response and they react to it. So I think part of the path of feeling and grounding yourself is being aware of what your instincts are telling you and honoring that that in order to use the intelligence in our body, which is our subconscious mind. And when you consider we're managing 30 billion billion biochemical reactions a second from that level of our mind, it's a very powerful level of mind, but the ego often ignores it. Yes. So if we, if we create stability, an awareness in our body, which we can tangibly feel, it's a real nice gateway to getting to the higher levels of consciousness. Mm-hmm. I, I completely agree. As I often say, if you don't listen to your body, you will. Yeah, it'll 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 ground you. <laughs> you'll you'll eventually hear your body. I promise. Yeah, I tell people the pain teacher always shows up when you don't listen. Yep. Hi, everyone. Please raise your hand if you enjoy having dried out, aged looking skin, wrinkled skin, acne, skin blemishes that make you look unhealthy, or skin that itches from lack of supportive nutrients. No hands? Just what I expected. You know, even though I'm a 60 year old man, I still want healthy skin because looking good helps me feel good too. Our skin is a living barrier that protects us from the sun, the elements, and a myriad of invasive organisms that try to enter us through our skin. Anyone that understands skin knows that good complexion begins on the inside, and that's exactly why Organifi created Organifi Glow, so you and your family can be healthy, stay young, and feel and look great from the inside out. My family and I love Organifi Glow, and so does our skin. This refreshing blend of organic nutrients not only tastes great, it supports your body's innate collagen production and promotes brighter, radiant skin. 
Boost your hydration and nourish your skin with 13 clinically studied superfoods. And unlike most companies that claim to be organic, Organifi does use certified organic nutrients and has been the only company that could show me their certifications upon request. Organifi Glow supports and promotes collagen synthesis so you regenerate beautiful skin naturally, supports and promotes hydration, nourishes your skin from the inside out by optimizing skin hydration. Organifi Glow includes Tremella Mushroom, which provides five times the moisture of hyaluronic acid, which is commonly used in skin products to increase moisture. Organifi Glow offers a delicious raspberry lemonade taste, but unlike most plant-based products, is certified to be free of glyphosate, which is extremely important today. It also includes plant-based collagen from bamboo, which is a very rare ingredient because most collagen is animal-based. Not only that, Organifi Glow includes bioavailable vitamin C from Ace of Rolla Cherry with all its natural cofactors that support absorption and supports your immune system at the same time. Additionally, it's important to remember that your skin is often a reflection of your gut health. The collagen and prebiotic fiber in Organifi Glow has been shown to improve gut health by repairing the gut lining and feeding healthy bacteria in our microbiome, so not just your skin, but your whole body gets nourished. To get your Organifi Glow and love your skin, go to Organifi.com forward slash check 20. And I'll even make it better. All Living 4D listeners get 20% off when they use the promo code capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 20. So your promo code is CHECK20, all in caps. Enjoy Organifi Glow. We love it. I love it. And I know you will too. Now, Doug, if, if on one side of Driven... Yeah, if we take a coin on one side of it's driven and the opposite side is the undriven, those that can't find anything to get excited or never seem to get what they want in life. Well, actually, well, let me restate it. What I'm saying is. You mean the happy people? No, I'm saying what if you, what if you have, what if you have um, someone that's driven that's in a relationship with someone that's very undriven? Mm. And maybe that other person's caught in, in, you know, victim mentality, sabotage, eternal child. Um, so you get this strong polarity, which often happens, as we've discussed earlier, because often very driven people don't want somebody else trying to control them. So they end up selecting somebody unconsciously that's very passive. But then they start getting very irritated, like, why the hell aren't you doing mm. anything? or? How come you're not helping pay the bills or any number of things? So what do you, either of you suggest for bringing balance between a driven and an undriven partner? Because um, I know exactly what that's like. My first wife uh, was very driven in her athletics, but undriven in her pursuits of, of other things. I was very career driven, um, study driven. I wanted to grow myself in every possible way. and I got to the point where I just got tired of her telling me what wasn't going to work and why I shouldn't do that and how I'd never make any money doing that. And so ultimately it led to us having a divorce. What would you have, what, what would you have said to somebody like us as, as a counselor of, of a, a marriage that's falling apart because the driven one is irritated by the one that's not so driven and vice versa. 17 years of marriage to my current wife. <laughs> well, I was married to her for 17 years. There you go. There you go. There is an elitism to being driven. Yeah. I get that is not that. deserved. <laughs> that is not deserved. Well, I mine, I again, mine. Again, and, again, <laughs> and again. And it, it is, it is a very clear. My wife has an electrical engineering degree, very smart woman. And she will attest to, I cannot say that she is not driven. That's offensive to her. Yeah. But she has a really nice, simple, logical way of going through the world. She likes to order, follow orders, follow rules. Those will keep us safe. Da, 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 da. That I can get on board with. What really rubs me, and I've seen this over and over and over between driven and non-driven, is, is risk-taking. Right. I do not perceive myself as a risk taker. But she does? Yep. 
That's what risk taking means is that people, other people see me as taking greater risk than I feel I'm taking. I don't feel them as risky. No, I thought the shit about this one and it's good. I can do this. I can do this. I can explain it ad nauseum to her and she'll look at me and go, you're nuts. That's not that. That's why the hell are you going to do that? That's crazy. It's not crazy. I've thought about it, and I'm trying to convince her that the reward to my soul is worth it. I always say no risk, no reward, because that's fairly true in many ways. And my wife will attest to how stability, predictability, cleanliness, order, structure makes my life so much better, but it doesn't come naturally to me. No, and that's very classic engineer thinking because that's their job. Yep. And so in that, I can appreciate how much she matches me, how much my qualities don't suit her as much as her qualities don't suit me. But in that, if I appreciate him and she appreciates my driven nature Mm -hmm. and understands my driven nature and doesn't take it personally. That's what I call a lock and key fit where you have, you know how a tin tumblers work, right? So when, where you have a high point, she has a receptive point where she has a high point you have to receive or the relationship breaks. The lock won't turn, but, but I'm, I'm really, see you, you figured that out. What's your advice? Either of you for the people that have this conflict, but they're not really aware of anything beyond their own ego's perception of the other person because that's what most people are looking through is their ego's perception in other words how do you save a relationship between a driven couple with a non-driven when they're at odds with each other if if there's a sort of a way of relating to that in my experience it's the driven one that's creating all the problems probably because that's that Mm -hmm. makes them feel alive Mm mm-hmm Mm -hmm. And so understanding that and really understanding that I am driven, it doesn't make me bad, doesn't make me wrong. I'm not doing this to hurt her. Right. Is profoundly helpful for me not having to explain myself all the time to her, which she experiences as, as defensiveness. Driven people, driven men in particular, are wildly defensive because of that shame. I'm not being a bad guy. This is what I was trying to do. Oh, you want to make us crazy is accuse us of being a bad person with no opportunity to explain yourself. No, I know you're a piece of shit. Get away from me. No, you don't understand. And it's that incongruence with it. Megan, you have let me ask Megan, do you think a driven woman, what, what would help a driven woman be married to a non-driven man? Um, Just like Paul was saying, the receptive to highs, like it would almost, feel like it was a better fit in a lot of ways, but then you, you run into the rub with the gender roles and and the typical embodiment of feminine and masculine, like male, female roles. But um, I I think it's appreciation. Like one, I have a friend um, who was complaining about her husband because he's not as organized as she is. And I just invited her to do an exercise of writing down all of those things or identifying what she does really like about him and understanding that they shouldn't be the same things that you bring to the relationship. Like I think women specifically get so upset because men, their husbands aren't bringing the same caliber of something like organization to the relationship. And it's like, well, he's, he's better served at bringing something else. You already bring organization or like my husband and I, we used to fight about money all the time because he is such a saver. And I'm like, money's made up. It only is as good as what we can buy with it. And that used to bring a ton of conflict because we did not agree until we realized that we were better off to appreciate each other for that disagreement. Because in every scenario, we see both sides of the aisle. We see how spending this money will make us happy. And we see how saving this money could make us more safe and and give us more flexibility and leverage. And in that disagreement, we can make a decision that's best for that scenario. But only with that disagreement can we feel confident that we're making the best decision. 
So it's appreciating that those differences are there instead of wishing someone just brought the same caliber of something as you to the relationship. Yeah, I, I think that's important. I tell people the best thing you can do when you're in a situation like that is to write down everything it is that you love about that person. And if you forgot, then just ask yourself how you felt about them when you got married. And sometimes it helps to rewrite your marriage vows or read your marriage vows to each other again and put your awareness on what you've lost sight of by getting too caught in the trenches of the day-to-day -day of, of life. And I think um, celebrating the beauty that we saw in each other reminds us why we were attracted to that person. Cause it's very easy to, um, it's very easy when you're stressed to look at and for the negative because stress polarizes you to the negative. Mm -hmm. And as, as a, as a psychologist and doing a doctoral dissertation on it, you see what you feel. That's literally the way it works is that I'm feeling this way and you'll see it. Yes. Yeah. You're learning how to be neutral or stable or calm in the body. Your perception actually becomes more accurate. Yeah. The feelings pre-frame the perception. Sensation comes first and that that is used to be hotly contested in psychology. Freud and Jung hated each other for it. Now in the last, t it's still hotly contested, but it, it's been put to rest. I mean, it's a seventh of a second that the body reacts first. And then if those sensations are strong enough, you will change your behavior. Yeah, I think we're in a, a, a strange environment. It's been a long time since Jung and Freud were around. And we're also in the information age where thinking yeah. is the driving force. And people are so disconnected from their bodies and their feelings. I think one of the big transitions we have to make is is to get out of our head and into our body or we don't actually feel anymore. I, I deal with huge percentages of clients that just have lost touch with their feeling nature, not only their feelings in their body, but even their feeling values. They don't really realize what their values are until they're in pain. And then they have to say, oh, I guess I should have had higher values for you know food or higher values for exercise or whatever. Um, one of the questions I wanted to, to get out of you was, um, when being a driven, how do you process goals and outcome goals help the driven focus on the present moment, yet achieve their genius and dreams? For example, on page 133, you state she trusted that following the process and staying out of the results would lead to success. Then on page 273, you share the outcome-based focus creates a false sense of pride it is also a route to sabotage. So there seems to be a paradox between process goals and not focusing on outcomes and outcome goals. I would love to know how the driven can still use process goals and outcome goals to help them achieve their genius while still focusing on climbing no poles. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the paradoxes of Zen. Um, as I often teach, there is no pole, but if I don't have one to climb, I'm not happy. And both are true, meaning that the outcome isn't really going to determine my worth in this world. It isn't. Yeah. I don't change whether I win the lottery or not. I'm still Doug. I would still this continuous, seamless thing. My circumstances may change, but it, it, it's not internal to my soul identity. And people that are identified with the outcome, I have to, and Meg was talking earlier about the toxic perfectionism, that is that toxic perfectionism, that I must succeed or I am a failure. You know, the second place is, no, that's just the first loser. You're still a loser. It's black, white. Where when I teach my shooting and I, you know, I've been trying to teach people this, this life tower, lifeguard tower insight and back as I was writing this book and developing these techniques. Um, I figured out that long range shooting and as a shooter, you can attest to that your 
the process doesn't change whether you're shooting at 50 yards or 500 yards or 5,000 yards. Not if you want to be good at it. Right. And so what makes someone good at it is following a series of very simple processes one after the next. Which are all connected to the breath. All connected to breath, all connected to being very still, very feminine. And you have to be in absolute stillness to achieve this fiery result. You want, and as Randy used to teach, he taught a lot, but it was this being held by your ambition, meaning that I have to hit this. There's something extra there. Rather than feeling on a soul level, pure ambition. And pure ambition is just this desire, not for an outcome, but this desire to succeed or this desire to be in the flow of it. And, you know, how do you hit a target at a thousand yards is simple. You just put one hand here, one here, you follow the process. Target one, particularly for women, women will always outshoot men. Every single time I've done this, even including Navy SEALs and that line that you took from my book is talking about a woman that outshot a Navy SEAL. He was a 28 year veteran Navy SEAL sniper trainer. She'd never picked up a gun before. That happens all the time in basic training. Yep. It's because women just follow the process. And they don't have any um, bad habits from playing with firearms. Exactly. And so she she completed four, out, she hit four out of five at a thousand yards. First time shooter. First time she's ever shot a gun. Did and they it's recruit her? <laughs> they probably recruit her. <laughs> we have a but job. Uncle Sam shooter. wants you. <laughs> Right. She goes walking back to the meditation cushions. I got people meditating and shooting is up one big, long practice. I, I will have you out to do it. But she goes walking back just as this Navy SEAL guy's walking up and she puts up four fingers and then fist pumps like this. And you could see his ego just get fired up. I mean, he absolutely had to beat this woman. And he promptly, he promptly missed the first shot. If I was single, the first thing I'd do is say, would you like to go out tonight? (laughs) (laughs) Because you're the kind of girl I want to be in the trenches with if the shit hits the fan. Right. And his ability to feel his ambition to be better than her was adding a whole lot of extra to shot three. So then he promptly hit two in a row. Then he missed another one. So his last shot, he, I mean, he was just coming unglued. He still talks about it 10 years later as the most impactful a moment of his life, how he experienced his ego sabotaging him. Oh, yeah. Uh, regarding your F buckets, friends, family, fitness, finance, fun, and faith, page 257 in your book, how much teaching of uh, how much of teaching this concept is about reprogramming the driven to see a new perspective of or what success is versus what they thought about success um, to mean. So how do you help people differentiate, for example, success from happiness or keep success in perspective so it doesn't end up destroying the rest of your life? I will speak to my 30 years of working with Drivens. Drivens are famous for this, is that we have three basic areas of life, finance, romance, and health. I mean, really simple. You can divide it up seven different ways, like I do in friends, family, fitness, finance, fun, faith. But what I teach in the book is that they're all really just one thing. Which is? Life. And Drivens are famous for optimizing one, I am in unbelievably good shape, having a second one that's okay, and a third one they don't want to talk about. But if you look at the center point of all of those, it's reflecting your whole life. And this is what's stuck in your body is your expectancy, meaning that this is how good I expect life to feel. And as we get closer to feeling that in one category, we use the other categories to balance the scales. So I'm still a piece of shit, but I'm great here, but I should suck here. And so a spiritual development is learning how to develop your whole life. 
Yeah, that's what holism is. Exactly. And so, you know, you can break it up a bunch of different ways, but as a driven person seeing that if I, if I work out in the morning, I've slept well at night, I'm looking forward to going on somewhere on Friday, I have a really good chance of hanging out with my wife tonight and not feeling all antsy, like I'm missing out on something. So is it my exercise or is it my fun or is it my fitness? Is it, what is it? Is it finance? What is it that makes me happiness? They're all the same thing. Yeah, one of my approaches is is I have a little saying, tell them what they want to hear, but give them what they need. And so if I was to be working with a driven and I looked at your buckets, friends, family, fitness, finance, fun, and faith, the way I handle those situations is I know that they're oriented toward what it is that they're driven toward, be it, you know, business success, athletic success. I as a therapist try to show them how having friendships enhances their performance, how managing their finances, having faith, or whatever it is that I know they need more of to balance themselves, because most of them have a hard time seeing how that connects to what they think they want. Exactly. But typically, I find if you can show them how it's actually integral to their overarching desire then they'll include it. But until they see that it, there's actually a, a logical, rational way that spending time with your family and being fully present enhances your performance, they always think it, it's a distraction from what they're here to do. And that is sabotage. That's self-sabotage. That is their ego holding them back from having a full life. Well, we've covered a hell of a lot. And, and even though we haven't got all the questions, we have touched on all of them. So I think we've covered a lot of ground. Uh, I think it's been an exciting podcast. And by the grace of great spirit, Megan, it was lovely to have your perspective Thank you. and, and a woman's um, perspective, especially a driven woman, because I think there's a lot of driven women that listen to my podcast. A lot of my uh Czech professionals are driven women because to make it through the program, it's, it's pretty intense. It's a lot of study and a lot of practice. Um, so I'm grateful that the women got to have your presence and even the men to hear what we often not only don't hear, but sometimes don't want to hear or don't perceive because of our narrow masculine focus. Um, where can people find out more about you guys? Um, what services do you offer? And I imagine your book is it available on Amazon. Yes, books on Amazon. Um, services. I'm a I'm a therapist, and then you know I work one on one. We do some group stuff. I do shooting meditation retreats. Megan, and I do these shooting meditation retreats where we. It is ninety nine percent about what's going on in your inner world, and one percent about guns. Good. And uh, do do you do any counseling with people, therapy uh, via the web, or is it all face to face? I haven't done it. Well, I do. Uh, it's all Zoom. I do everything on Zoom, all all internet. Okay, so people can get you from around the world. Megan, do you offer any of these services or or uh, anything yep. like that? So uh, Doug and I, I do the shooting retreats with Doug, and I work one on one primarily with women driven women. Um, and then we have a couple online offerings that we're working on um, just to give driven people more tools and resources. So we have um, a meditation course that's specific to the open eye meditation that Doug teaches and, and teaches at the retreats. Um, and we're also working on an office hours option. So folks can have a Zoom face-to-face -face opportunity once a week. Great. Well, thank you very much, both of you. And again, uh, Doug's book is Driven, Understanding and Harnessing the Genetic Gifts Shared by Entrepreneurs, Navy SEALs, Pro Athletes, and Maybe You. It's Douglas Brockman, B-R-A-C-K-M-A-N-N-P-H-D. And Paul, if I can add, we have an assessment um, that kind of gives you a, a range of 10 traits that we've identified as driven traits. Um, and anyone can take that assessment. It takes about five minutes uh, at IamDriven.com. 
Okay, IamDriven.com. Assess yourself and just see how much trouble you've gotten yourself into. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and just for my own uh, my own sake, that is a real assessment. It's not a gen. It's not a gen lead tool like everybody might think, but it, I had it nationally normed and validated. The results are real. I mean, it, it says a lot. It's really cool. Yeah, great. All right. Well, it's been a great conversation. I will say thank you to my sponsors for all your love, support, great products, and loving me enough to sponsor the podcast. Thank you all of you for anything you buy from the sponsors. A little commission goes to me uh, to help fund the podcast so I can take the time out of my schedule to find geniuses like Doug and Megan to inform you and support you in your own growth and development. And uh, thank you to all of you. I think we all understand at this point, we need to make some changes in the world. And the first place we've got to start is with ourselves. Trying to change the world without changing yourself is probably a form of lunacy. Um, but if we make ourselves better, we know for sure we left the world a little better than when we found it. And it's easier to start at home than it is anywhere else. Because at least you know you're in agreement with the person you're working with. So thank you guys once again. Lots of love. And uh, I hope lots of people reach out to you for help, uh, either as Drivens or even as partners of coach partners of Drivens to help them understand and, and relate better. Yes. And kids. And yeah. kids. Yeah, the Driven Kids thing is, is a, that's a little bit trickier, but it's, it is incredible to offer this insight to a 14 year old and they get it they get it right away well just like when they teach kids how to bend spoons like they do it very easily but adults have a real hard time using their mind to bend a spoon because they don't believe it can be done but meanwhile spoons are dripping around all the time in the hand of a six-year-old <laughs> exactly all right lots of love everybody thank you guys and you, uh you guys i look forward to continuing our relationship i love what you're doing thank Thanks. you Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guests, Dr. Doug Brackman and Meg Terwilliger. You can find the Driven Tribe online at IamDriven.com. There, you can learn more about the Driven Retreats, courses, and other opportunities to connect. Also, check out Dr. Doug's book, Driven, available from Amazon.com and all good bookstores. Follow Paul on Instagram at paul.check, on Twitter at paulcheck, or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash living 4D with Paul Check. You can watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com and get your free subscription to Check videos and more at the Czech Institute's new media site, chekiva.com. You can read the show notes and find links to the resources mentioned in this episode at checkinstitute.com forward slash podcast. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review at the top of the show page on Spotify or at the bottom of the show page if you are listening on Apple Podcast.